I don't know. Right? Okay. <clears throat> Cool. So feel free to stop and ask me questions. Uh, I mean, you can shout it out or raise your hand. If I'm not looking, just shout something out if you have a, a question. So don't don't feel bad interrupting. It's supposed to be a workshop. So um, the way I formatted it um, is it's basically um, it's an introduction to computational finite element analysis. I highlight that because you can do hand finite element analysis. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, um, this is kind of going into how you're going to use software to perform uh, FBA. So how do you do that? That's, I'm trying to do it. Can you train? Like, you can't point it, huh? It's mechanical. I think it's OK. It happens to go right on that bar. <coughs> Although, I, there might be a couple slides taking that off. Um, the, way, the way I structure this is I have a presentation that I'm going to go through um, to lay a foundation, <clears throat> and then I'm going to work through like a case study um, where you got to just watch me do some some simulation stuff, um, and then I really people want to stay, they want to run their own, or like actually what I did, or they have their own FBAs, or they've been running that for Formula or for Baja, I can walk around and kind of help them out. Um, so this the presentation is going to cover just like the intro, setting up a FIM, which is a finite element model, uh, interpreting the results uh, of, the, of the model, some general tips, how to present your results, and then I'll do some example cases. Um, it's not meant to cover detailed, you know, uh, FDA theory through hand count. And I'll, just, I'll introduce that a little bit, but that's not what I'm trying to focus on. Um, or a step by step. SolidWorks tutorial. In fact, this was meant to be a general FBA, so you could use any software. So this is kind of trying to lay a foundation where once you understand how computers do FBA, um, you could use any software and, and have it run a successful FBA. That was my intent for this. Since you guys are using SolidWorks and I want to do some examples, I do run into some simulation. And a little of this is specific to SolidWorks simulation. Um, and I just, I, I use different FBAs, so I actually just learned a couple weeks ago, so I'm not like super expert on the SOLIDWORKS simulation, like exactly how to do everything, but I, I didn't know how to run FBA and other software, right? So this was kind of, it's like some of this stuff you probably can't I'm gonna talk about, you may not even be able to do in SOLIDWORKS simulation, because, you know, uh, it may not be as powerful as some other ones. Um, so I just want to be up front, but that's kind of my intent, but I want you guys to have the knowledge to Good foundation, and then it doesn't matter what software you're using. Uh, and then it's based on um, static analysis. So I'm not talking about how to do dynamics because you will you will need to know more things if you want to do dynamic, especially thermal. Uh, nonlinear is a whole other topic, right? And I'll talk about what nonlinear means as far as yeah, uh, modal analysis, uh, transient analysis, shocks, buffering, uh, fatigue. Or composites. Um, now, um, composites is not that much different than what I was using for solid structural. It's more how you how you build an element. But um, I kind of put all these down so you understood that there's a lot of different type, types of analysis, and you'll set up your model differently if you're doing a different model than static structural. Um, okay, so this is what is FBA? Uh, FBA is finite element analysis. Um, the other acronym we're going to be using is FEM, which is a finite element model. Um, so let's just say if someone says, hey, you have a CAD of that data worm, you're expecting a 3D geometry file, right? If I say you have a FEM, it's an analysis file with the geometry and the meta sheet and all that stuff. Um, the main objective of FEA is to break up large structures into smaller ones and then assess the larger structure by piecing it all back together, right? Um, another way to say that, right, you're trying to solve a large, complicated equation by adding up the results of smaller, simple, you know, equations. Um, and this smaller, simple equation is the finite element part, right? There's a finite number, uh, there's a discrete number of solutions you're adding up. Um, and then the elements are small, uh, they can be very small in some cases, but um, uh, that, that's why it's called finite and, and element is the breaking up uh, parts. 
Um, so the elements are, the, are these small structures and they're connected together by nodes. Um, this is kind of an example, right? Because, so this is getting cut off. Um, you guys probably already do finite element and you don't even know it, right? Like if someone gave you this geometry, by sixth grade, you got a finite area of this thing. And then number one from that, you're gonna say find an area of this random shape, right? So what are you gonna do to solve that, right? You're gonna say, oh, I know, I know the area of the square, and I know how to get the area of the triangle. So I'm just gonna solve the area of this and solve the area of that, I'm gonna them up. Right? That's basically that's a, the, the dumbest way I can kind of explain like finite element analysis, right? And so what you did was you made elements, you made two elements, right? And you created those by boundaries, those are nodes, right? So that's kind of a real simple example of what finite element uh, analysis is doing. Uh, this is further defining nodes and elements. So a node, um, you know, is a point in space um, where there's degrees of freedom. Um, and the results of FEA are going to be typically given at the nodes. So when you solve for deflections, stresses, and deflections, I said typically because software will also give you elemental stresses. So if it's an elemental stress, it's giving you the average of all the nodes that the elements touch. And I'll come in, that's kind of important in a later point I have about making sure you have enough elements through the thickness um, of, of material. So the nodes is really where all, like all the math's happening. Um, uh, we are kind of solving for all the outputs and stuff. The, the element defines how those degree of freedom of each node relate to each other, right? And also how the deflections can create stress, right? So to get the stress from the node is you have to know how far it is from the other node and what the element that's that's connecting the nodes has a certain stiffness and that's how you're getting deflections and stresses at nodes. Um, so here's a couple examples of node uh, element types. I'm going to go way deeper into this. Um, so I don't need to talk too much about these. This is like the part most complex and type of uniform. That's what you, you your solid meshes that you're going to you're probably going to see in the solver simulations a bunch of types of uniform. Uh, but uh, it can be as simple as a line between two nodes, that's an element. Um, and then the difference between here is, and we're talking about this soon, is that it's going to linkly interpolate between the two nodes, right? And so there's actually other elements that um, you create the element and then it has these sub nodes in between. You get, a, you get like a polynomial instead of a linear fit, basically, um, which is less common to see these. It's more computer time. So you typically see, you know, this one and this one, and then these simple 2D ones. Oh, uh, actually, I did want to ask, um, figure out what kind of classes people have taken. How many, raise your hand if you've taken statics already. Okay, so there's a couple who had, raise your hand if you haven't taken statics. Oh, okay. Um, raise your hand if you have not taken strength uh, of materials. Okay, so you guys are not allowed to run FEA, basically. Um, so yeah, that's the minimal knowledge you need to be able to uh, understand FEA and, and run it, right? You can watch YouTube videos on how to create a match and all this stuff in SOLIDWORKS. You're not going to understand FEA unless somehow you have that knowledge and you just didn't take the class. But that's kind of the minimum requirements of that. So some of this stuff may not actually make sense because I'm talking about stiffness matrices and 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 stuff like that. So I understand those are the two fundamental classes at minimum that you need to not just take, but I've under, understood those to really be able to successfully perform FEA. Um, so this is what the ba basic FEA calculations are. Um, so you're gonna it's it's just a simple uh, deflection uh, stiffness times deflection is your force, right? So you have a four, it's all matrix and al algebra. Um, do they still offer the, the FEA class here? Those of you used to teach it, I don't know if you teach it now. Um, Are they taking it? FEA? Yeah. yeah. It's hard. You can teach it for the past couple of years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, have you taken it? No. No. Has anyone here taken that? Okay. You guys should. Okay. You guys uh, should, because you're going to do a bunch of, it's, 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 it's tedious. But it gives you a way better understanding of it. Yeah, that's one of the best classes I took, actually. Um, so 
it's it's uh, you have a four, and you can solve for any of this, right? So um, typically, you know some of the forces, and then you know the displacements, right? We'll, uh, I'll get into that. So it's just forces is the stiffness matrix, and then um, you get the deflection. So uh, the displacements are calculated at each node, at each node, um, and then the you have to know certain certain forces and displacements, right? You have to have certain nodes. Um, so in this matrix, you're going to set up where forces are, and then you're going to put zero for the nodes that don't have forces on them, and then for the displacements, you're going to put zero where a node you're constraining, right? And the rest you're going to solve for. So you're going to you can solve you're going to solve for displacements, and once you have the stiffness matrix, right? You can you can solve for stress, right? And so that's basically what's going on. Um, Keep in mind what K is. K is a couple things, right? It's the stiffness matrix, which is a cross-sectional area. It's lengths, and it's modulus, right? So that's what the stiffness matrix is. So any any material, so material properties you can change it, um, and any geometries you can change your outputs. Okay, this is the basic form of the equation, right? This is the easiest form of this equation to to think about, um, but for, for other kinds of analysis, it's very similar, but the parameters are a little bit different, right? For example, in thermal, that stiffness matrix is going to be thermal conductivity, and then that displacement is going to be temperatures at those nodes, right? So this kind of applies to most of it. Um, that's what FE is doing, is taking matrix and basically doing matrix algebra for you on a bunch of simple problems. Okay, so... She can fix it on your computer. She just has to change the resolution if you want, or if you just want to keep doing this. This? Um, oh, I can. I mean, I know how to change the resolution. I looked like it was blurry before. Is this readable to people? Like, I can try it. Did you say the other crystal? You did. You did a lot. Yeah. Well, I recommend this one. Did it change? It changed, change, but it went back to it. Oh, wait. There's another, uh, I don't know, it seems like it's the same, right? I can go a little smaller. Sorry, it keeps going back. I mean, it's saying it changed my resolution, but. I think it's workable. It's basically the title. And uh, if anything, um, that's much better. <laughs> I think it's I think it's okay. Um, okay, so this is kind of the FBA process, and basically, I'm going to talk about each of these things in my in the presentation. Um, so you define the model geometry. That's the first thing, right? You have, there's a part you want to analyze, right? So <clears throat> typically, when you start drawing stuff. Especially if you know you're going to do FEA on it, think think about that ahead of time, right? So understand understand that you're going to do analysis, and you want to make it simple to be able to do analysis, right? Um, so you want to keep it simple. Um, if you can start and only do sketches, just do sketches, right? Um, now, uh, for SolidWorks, you can use weldments. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but you should be using weldments like to make frames. Um, so all you do is pass sketches, and then the weldments. Are in the toolbox, and you can define your own elements, and then it just puts that challenge on the sketches for you, basically, right? Um, in other softwares, you just use the sketches, and you just, in the finite element model, you just tell the, the tool what the geometry, cross sectional geometry is. So you don't need any physical geometry, you just decide sketches. And um, I'll get into that a little bit further, but that's that's the simplest way to do it, just do, do sketches. Um, Use a uh, use like whole 
instead of, uh, you know, if you have a part that you don't have a multi on it, don't draw a sketch that has a square. Do you have a marker that there? Yeah, I don't know which bit um, you know, if you don't draw a sketch like this and extrude it, okay, draw this and extrude that, and then use the hole wizard and put a hole in it. Okay, that, that's that's more of a SolidWorks uh, or a CAD tip, um, but it's going to affect your FEA because you're going to see later you're going to want to simplify your geometry and remove holes. And there's an easy way to do that when it's a feature. Um, when it's embedded in the sketches, it's a lot harder. Also, if you want to make this a tap hole later or whatever, it's just way easier if it's in your hole wizard to change that hole than to go into a sketch. So you should always be using like features. Same with the fillets. Um, uh, I think I wrote this somewhere. If you know you're gonna like have fillets here, don't draw a sketch that has fillets in in the sketch. Okay, draw it a sharp square. And use the fillet feature and make fillets. That way, you can send with the holes. You can remove it later, and it's easier to change. And a lot of times, you might like connect to a node in a sketch, you know, that later gets changed or moved, right? Um, so you and you should be doing that kind of stuff towards the end, like adding fillets and all that towards the end, so that you don't have parametric features attached to fillet surfaces and stuff like that. Um, so think about this stuff when you when you first start drawing. Um, you know, it'll make it a lot easier to do FBA. No, and do not model threads. Never model threads. I mean, especially if you can do FBA. You should not have any threads in there. It'll, when you mesh it, it's going to try and mesh the threads, and it's not a good idea at all. So just do the pilot hole. That's going to be the, you know, for the thread. Uh, I think there's a option to stop it. Just show a thread Okay, so you make your geometry. You're finding the analysis type, so you can tell the software, hey, I want to do an analysis. It's going to know what, what type you want, right? So it's just that structural, thermal, multiple dynamic. So you, you select that. Um, and then you got to, you know, put the element type, which hopefully you kind of already thought about when you did this, right? Am I going to, am I going to use themes? Am I going to use plates? And I'm going to all that stuff. So you got to decide what type of elements you're going to use. Then you define the element geometry. But if you're not using solid mesh, then you know you tell the beam cross section, uh, including orientation. Now in SolidWorks, I think um, if you're like using one, I don't think there's an option to do this. I think I don't think you can have a sketch and then just tell it what the cross section is. I think you have to have solid geometry because that's like your will or whatever. But the other software, so if you know the software. You literally just tell it this sketch has this area and this inertia. You don't have to tell it it's an ID, it's a square, it's whatever. You just give it the A and the I. That's all it cares about. And then the set, and it doesn't matter where the shear center is and, and the neutral axis is, right? Um, so you just put that stuff in, and then you have to tell it, it its orientation, right? So if you give it an ID, you have a sketch that doesn't know how to orient that ID. So you give it a vector um, and, and, and whatnot. So uh, I mean, it can be hard to keep track of, um, but that's part of the process. You define the geometry, whether you're doing it in the FEA or it's been done in the kind of way. Then you define the material properties. Um, you create the mesh, uh, which is how it breaks up all the elements. Um, and you want to simplify your geometry before meshing, removing holes and fillets. Um, and then uh, define your boundary conditions, which will make or break your model. Uh, define the load cases, which also can make or break your model. Um, and you compute the results, you post process it, and, and then you iterate this process until you come up with the design. I have no idea how long this presentation is going to take, by the way. <laughs> You're only 20 uh, minutes in. Yeah. So far. I'm going to walk through each of those steps right now. Uh, okay, so these are the types of elements. Like a lot of this might be foreign language to you guys, so um, again, ask questions if you want, but I understand you might come back and look. I did this so you can reference it later. Once you take more classes, maybe, and, and try it a couple times, it's going to make more sense to you guys. Um, okay, so 1D elements, right? So basically, 1D, 1D, 2D, and 3D are the types of elements, right? So 1D elements. Um, um, 
if you have one you have to apply forces and constraints at nodes, right? So you have to be when you make those, if you like if you have an I beam and you want to put a load in the middle, you have to break that into two sections. Because you need a node in the middle to put a load on. Where if it's a solid mesh, you you can put loads anywhere, right? So um so just know that when you do one of the elements, you have to make sure you have a nose where you need them. Um, so a spring can be a one, a, a one degree or three arm element. All right, is a is a wood element has a one degree or three arm, right? So you can put springs in your model, and you just type in the stiffness. Doesn't matter what the geometry looks like, you just put in pounds per inch, whatever. Um, so you, springs are one of the elements. So this work get kind of complicated. There's a rod, or you also see it called a truss. And some softwares um, have a little bit different meaning between rods and truss, but if you do a rod or a truss, it can only support axial loads. Okay? It doesn't take bending or torsion or shear. So it has to be a truly a truss structure, right? It has to be it has to be built to where you only have nodes or forces at nodes and connectors at nodes and then call transfers between the axis, you know, compression or tension. Okay, otherwise you're gonna you're gonna get uh, errors. So, um, but it's super quick to run analysis that way. And it's super simple. Um, so there's a hard rod to trust. Some software is actually, this way you have to check your software, will allow rods to get forward in two. Um, so just, just make sure when you start a program that you understand the definition of their elements. Okay, a bar will support axial um, bending, torsion, and shear, but it has to be symmetric, right? So you have to have, you can't have like a C channel or an L channel where the neutral axis is not also um, the shear center. Or, um, and so um, bar and beam are the same exact thing if it's a square or some kind of symmetric thing. A bar or a beam element will give you the same result. But if you're using something that's not uh, symmetric, then it's a beam. And so a beam supports all types of loading, right? So bending, torsion, shear. Um, and it can be uh, non-symmetric. I highlight it in green because this is the this is the element that I think is the best element to use. Is 1D beams. That's the quickest uh, solution, the most robust. It's 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 hard to screw that up. Like out of the rest of these, that's that's the most robust one to start off on. However, it has to apply to your your load phase, right? I mean, you can't always do that when you have uh, you know, a solid geometry that has loads in different places that it's just not a beam, right? Um, and I'll get in, I'll get into a little more detail on some of these elements later. Okay, so then you have 2D elements, which can be a little bit more confusing um, and more complicated. Uh, so you have a plane stress element. So these only support in plane loads, like mem like a membrane, right? Um, so do not support any other plane loads at all. Um, so it's very specific when you want to use those. Um, and, but then you have plates, which supports out-of-plane loads only. So it can, it can bend in two, in two directions in, in the plane. Um, you, you model this as a plane with just a user-defined thickness. So um, you can either take the, the CAD geometry and tell it apply the CAD geometry, or you can just type in, it's a plate that's this thick. <clears throat> Okay, and then shells are kind of the combination of the two. So a shell supports membrane and bending loads. Um, and it can be curved, which is useful. So like, if you had an I-beam that was curved, you couldn't make that a beam element, right? Yeah. Unless you made a bunch of small ones, right? And, and a bunch of straight ones. So if you have a curved one, you can just make it, you can make it a plate, um, or shell, if you, you just make it a shell. And we're going to do this in an, an example. Um, and uh, and that's that's kind of like the best use of it is when you have like things that you want to be beams, but it has a weird shape to it. That's when you use shells. Um, so you want something with a high aspect ratio, you know, something that's in material like kind of one. So you can use shells on like a faha frame. You could do shell mesh. Uh, I recommend beam, but you can also use shell mesh, um, not solid mesh. <laughs> that's when we'll, we'll get into that. So things with a high aspect ratio like this, you don't want to do solid mesh. You want shells or beams. Um, yeah, I think I hit all those other points. Oh, so, uh, so on this side, so when you do a 1D, this is what you have to do in this in the software. You, um, when you draw it, you have to give it a length. So you just have to give it 
you have to define this geometry by just the length. That's all you're, you're telling it. And then you have to give it additional info, which is what's the area, cross sectional area for that length. The way you do that might be modeling it or it might be typing it into the FBA program. When you do um, 2D map elements, you have to actually define the area. So you define the area. And then you just have to tell it what the thickness is. Okay. Now when you get in 3D, which you have probably a visual to use in 3D, I'm, I'm guessing, if you've been doing FBA. Um, in this case, you're defining the whole volume through your CAD, and there's no other user input you have to give to the FBA. It has everything as far as the geometry. So 3D elements, tetrahedral, um, can be used on any 3D uh, geometry. This is, like I said, this is the ones you're probably going to see in SolidWorks. Um, there's a bunch of different types. I didn't even put them on here because I don't want to confuse you guys, and I don't, I don't know the difference between all of them because I don't come across a lot of these other ones. Um, but tetrahedral will give you is this private one to stick to, uh, and I don't, I don't think in SolidWorks you can change it. But um, the other ones will give you like eight different options for what what the shape. This is what the tetrahedral looks like. What kind of shape you're going to use for three D meshing, and it depends on how it's going to be and how many nodes you're going to have and how it's going to be geometry. Um, these other ones I put on just, just so you know, but we don't really use them that often in my experience, which is bricks or prisms. So these these have very high aspect ratios, um, which reduces your mesh size, basically reduces your degrees of freedom. Um, and you use this when you know we either don't care about a section of the park, um, or it's it's not it's just not an area that's highly loaded or something like that. And so basically a large uh, element that's pretty kind of relatively stiff, um, and an example would be like a rim, maybe, and we're trying to look for for uh, elements like on the uh, on the spine or on the spokes, and you don't care about the surface or the tire mounts. Those can all be bricks, basically, and then you mesh the the, the um, read the bottom. Oh, and then the bottom says pyramid. Um, and a pyramid is what you, you do when you transition from bricks to tetrahedrals. So on, on the rim, if you have bricks on the outside, you don't you can't transition right to the tetrahedral. So you have a, a pyramid which which does that. Um I think something else, but I can't remember now. Uh okay. Okay, here's some examples. And, and this is the case study that I'm gonna do after this presentation. We're gonna take an I-beam and we're gonna model it using 1D, 2D, and 3D mesh and see what you think the best results are. Um, so if you do 1D, this is what we found what it looks like. So again, this is an I-beam, I, I do a line. This is the simplest you can do to model it because you just have a line and then you can make elements off of that line. So in the cat model, it would be a line. I use you know, well, the weld feature in SolidWorks, so that's what it looks like when you apply the weldment. I didn't have to draw this at all. Um, and then this is what the mesh looks like. So you have to start, you know, in your mind, separate CAD from, from the mesh uh, or from elements because visually, they come up like anything. It doesn't matter because it's the math that matters. So this looks like a hexagon or something, right? And it has a bunch of elements, even though it's Two elements, it, it breaks this, it broke this mesh up into a bunch of different elements. Um, you might think that's the geometry, that's just how SolidWorks represents it. But it doesn't, there's no point in drawing using uh, memory to draw that because it's just, a, it's just a number, right? And so, in fact, you don't even need anything, you can just be a line with the number. Um, so, don't get scared when you see meshes that don't look like the geometry when you do 1D. Because it's just a representation. Uh, it's, not, it's not trying to represent the actual hardware. Okay, if you were to do this in 3D, you would actually have to draw all this CAD model out. And I guess you could still use a weldment feature, but you would put all this. So this is like the, there's no line here. This is like sketch that's extruded. You have to make mid surfaces, right? So when you do a 2D, you just have a plane, right? It's infinitely thin. So you have to make mid surfaces out of this ID. Which is a feature to do that in SolidWorks. When you do that, you can have a little gap, right? So you have a mid surface here, that's going to be a mid surface here, and you know, there's going to be a gap between where this mid surface ends and this horizontal one begins. So 
then you have to do more work to extend that surface and join that, right? Then this is what the mesh looks like. So the mesh just looks just like the 2D with the elements broken up on it. So now you can turn on the thickness of the elements to, to see what the geometry looks like. And this will represent the geometry better than this one will. But it's not exactly perfect because you can have, it's going to look like you have interference. The math's going to be right. But when you extrude this and extrude this, it looks like you have like double material on top of each other, right? Um, so you're going to see weird things when you do 2D meshes, but the, the math is what matters. Okay, and then the 3D mesh, all the same as you would do here. And you can skip that and you, and you just mesh it. Um, but you can see out of all of these, this has the denser mesh, right? This has a lot more elements, um, and it's a lot more labor intensive, at least for the computer, which will matter as you get bigger and bigger models and, and you want to iterate a bunch of times. Any questions so far on like the meshes? I know that like, bars versus beams versus plates can be confusing, so um, you might have to read that a couple of times. But it's important to know if you do the wrong element, you can't take certain loads and your results are going to be wrong. So it's important to understand those. Yeah, then what would you so like which ones would you suggest they're doing like frame versus like an upright versus you know is there some like is there some common suggestion for I, I have a slide on picking elements um but I can still answer that I mean for frame 100 percent it's beam elements it's 1d elements for frame yeah. there's no you should not be meshing a frame that, that has a hollow tubing right it, even if it was solid if it was solid rod you would still use beams so any kind of truss structure or anything like that, you want to use being, even if it's not a true truss, because like the frame's not a true truss, right? Because, but yeah. um, you need to have, uh, with the frame, if you're gonna have like loads where the suspension comes in, you need to make sure there's nodes at the suspension points. Um, but yeah, 100%, um, you should be doing beam elements for that. Um, and you can combine, and I'll talk a little bit about that. You can combine, like you can have a thing that has beams that then transitions to solid, 3D solid and stuff like that. Um, solid mesh, uh, yeah, I think, I think later I go into choosing the elements, um, but was there, yeah, any other questions that anyone's hung up on? So I'm going to reference these, uh, going forward. This one might be, um, I don't know if, uh, how SolidWorks does these, I didn't, I didn't try to do this in SolidWorks yet, but there's uh, other types of elements called rigid body elements, so RBEs. Um, so these are rigid connections between mesh components. Um, so they typically see them as like, they call it a spider connection when you want to like, connect, you connect a central node, which is an independent node, to a bunch of other nodes which are dependent on that node. Um, and so for example, if you wanted to do a bolt, this would like kind of represent the washer. Um, and so you would have a, a central node and a bunch of other nodes connecting this. And then you could like, Put a load on that center node, and it'd be like loading your part. Um, that's not the best way to do passing. That's just an example. Um, that might be the best way to do it. So, um, so there's a difference between RBE two and RBE three. I don't know what happened to RBE one, but there's another question. Um, so RBE two is what has stiffness to the model. Um, all the nodes will just place the same amount. So you have a center node here. And uh, if you if you if it the place displaces half a millimeter, all the nodes attached to it have to move up with it at half a millimeter. So you artificially rigid, rigidize that whole area that's connected to that. Um, uh, another another way to think of this, another example might be um, if you had like a, if you had a, for some reason you were trying to tie a plate with like the bolt holes together. Let's say you had a load. Let's say you're pointing up on this plate. And so you made an RBE2 like here, and you're gonna pull up on it, and you connect it with a spider you know, to these other things. And you wanna see what the load in the plate is, or at, at these forces are, or at these holes are, if you're pulling up on this plate. If these are RBE2s, when you pull up on this, it's basically making this whole square rigid. It's gonna bypass the structure. This, this could be paper, it doesn't matter. It's gonna treat it like it's a brick. Because however much this node moves, these other ones have to move the same amount with it. Okay, so you're actually going to get the same forces in all four of these holes, basically, right? So you have the same displacement. So if you but if you do an RBE three, 
um, that center node is distributed to the other nodes, right? So, you know, if you put, you know, a uh, hundred pounds here, if it's a RBE2, you're going to see 25, 25, 25, 25, even though you should see more loads for, for your pulling on down here. So RBE3, if you put a hundred pounds on, you know, you might see like 30, 30, 20, 20, or something like that. So it matters when you're using RBE2 or RBE3. The one we got to remember that is I used the two. The RBE2 is too stiff. That's how I remember that, right? RBE2 is too stiff. Um, that, that's how I remember that. So I usually am using RBE3, but there's, there's times to use RBE2. Like doing this with RBE2 is, is okay because you have a washer there. You're not trying to determine the deflections of the washer or anything. You're assuming basically the, rock, the washer's ratio is relative to this material. Right? So it's okay to, to do that. It might be more appropriate to do that. Um, so I, again, I don't know um, if uh, I haven't tried to put RBE. RBEs into SOLIDWORKS simulations. So I don't know what they call those if we have rigid elements there. Um, oh, so an uh, example would be like your, uh, that engine. Let's say for Ba, you wanted to see uh, the loads on like the engine plate or something like that. You're not going to model the engine. There's no reason, right? You're going to have a mass, right? And then you, you got to put that mass almost like what I just do to four points. You don't want those to be RBE2s or your whole plate's going to seem really stiff. Um, Okay, and then there's non-structural mass, uh, which is like what I just talked about. You could put non-structural mass to represent an engine or some, something that you're supporting that's not adding stiffness to your model. Right? So non-structural mass is very useful, and um, instead of having to put loads like a force in a certain direction, you can just put a non-structural mass, um, and you have to turn gravity on to do stresses, or you can if you're doing load analysis. It doesn't matter. You just you just have a mass there. As part of the spring mass system. Um, yeah, this was another example. I think you guys get it. Get it. Um, so, by the way, who here has already like run some kind of analysis in SolidWorks simulation? Has some FEA? Raise your hand if you ran a model in F in C Okay, so we actually less people than I thought. Okay. Um, Okay, here, here we go, choosing an element type. Okay, so you first think what's the analysis used for? Um, you know, things like is it a quick study, is it a long-term model? You, you, it might be a sensitivity study where you're just trying to see the difference between two different things. You don't care necessarily about the absolute result, and so you just want like the quickest, you know, resu uh, result might change the type of element you're using. Um, if it's a long-term model, like maybe, you know, eventually it's going to turn into something that needs to be a solid mesh, you know, and they might change how you, how you approach it. Um, but more important than that is like what loads and what boundary conditions are you applying, right? Do you have out of plane loads, right? Because we talked about elements that can't support out of plane loads. Do you, do you have to constrain the model over an area or can you pick a node? Can you pick a point? Where's, where are you constraining this? Because that'll determine where you have elements, uh, where you have nodes. Um, and you might actually have to add surfaces, like on a solid mesh, you might have to add a surface to apply a load to, because it doesn't really exist in, in, in your model. Um, yeah, that's how our load is being applied. So like I said before, you want to stick with beams and plates whenever possible. Uh, I said plates is really shell meshes, is probably what you can use more often. Um, however, for short structural members, uh, where you have a ratio, I think I have a chart on this later. Um, the ratio of its, you know, long, it's cro the longest cross-sectional dimension um, um, over its length is less than three. It's going to tell you um, it doesn't want to, SolidWorks at least. The, this this number applies to SolidWorks. I don't know what other FBAs, other FBAs probably don't warn you at all. They just think you know what you're doing. Um, if it's less than three, it's going to say you need to use a solid mesh. Um, the reason for that is, uh, as you know, if you have a short stubby beam, you know, when you do beam formulas, um, bending, you know, dominates most of the time. And transverse shear is not, you know, a, a big driver in your overall stress. So when, it, by when you get a short stubby beam, like if you're calling something a beam, it's only this, this long and only like this lot, right? and it was like super deep but really short. Transverse shear is actually going to dominate more than bending. Um, 
think, I think the race, the, I, I've heard four to one before, but SolidWorks assumes, I guess, three to one is no longer really treating it like a beam. And so once you do solid mesh, so just know that you should get a, you'll get a warning. Um, if you know what you're doing, you can ignore that, that warning. Um, if you know that transvert, you're not worried about transverse stresses or it's not loaded, maybe it's just all axial load and it doesn't matter. <clears throat> um, so there is times when you don't want to use beams, um, because it's not appropriate. So solid mesh, which I think most students start with solid mesh. I, I understand why. Cause you're just like, it's solid geometry. Let me just, you know, do the solid mesh and not have to worry about what kind of loads there are if plates or beams. However, um, you should try to avoid solid mesh. Um, some of the problems are you'll get relatively speaking, ex extremely long commutational times, not just to mesh it. You'll see, you know, your little bar going every time you mesh something and then it's going to run a little bit longer. I mean, that stuff adds up and especially in industry, when, when you have millions of degrees of freedom uh, in models. Um, we have models that take uh, over 48 hours of just the computer running to, to solve. And so when people want to iterate on that, you're telling me I have to spend a week to do one iteration, basically. You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's expensive. It's also a difficult and long iteration process because to redo something, you have to basically change the geometry and then remesh it. So like in that I-beam example, let's say I go, oh, this is I beam's not strong enough. I need to make it thicker. I have to go back to my pad, you know, make it thicker, remesh it, rerun it. Whereas if I have a beam, I just go, oh, let me make the inertia of this. And I just type in a new inertia. Or I just, or you can, if you have a plate, you just go, oh, make it a quarter inch thick instead and rerun it. You're not, you don't have to go back to your CAD model and change geometry. Um, so it's a, it's a long process to, to redo that. And then sometimes, actually, maybe every time you do that, you might have to redefine your loads because you have a new mesh now. And the node that you are applying something to now doesn't exist there anymore. So, um, And then you're going to get a very dense uh, mesh um, for some, set, some areas. So you have really small features. You're just going to get a million uh, you know, elements in that area. And it's probably not going to give you accurate results, uh, as we'll talk about later, um, about why uh, element shapes matter <clears throat> um, or you're not going to get enough elements like through the thickness so if you have like a 35 thou tubing you know an old 35 wall tubing that's pretty long you're back it's going to just give you one element like through that whole thickness and uh, that can give you inaccurate results when you have bending right and you know remember I said elements average out stresses right so if you had um, if you just have one element through the thickness and the top, you know, the top's in, bend, in tension and the bottom's in compression, right? So you're bending. And let's say this is like the center, this was like the center of it, of it and this is the element node. You might have like minus a thousand psi on this, uh, or plus a thousand on the top, and plus a thousand on this side. And this might say minus a thousand, right? Because if the neutral axis is down in the middle. So, if you if you look at average elemental stress, it's going to tell you there's no stress in this part. It's going to say zero, right? So you need to break this up into two elements. So now this says zero here and zero here and minus minus a thousand here and minus a thousand here, right? So you, you want at least two elements through the thickness. Um, and some people will tell you you need three elements through the thickness. And sometimes it doesn't matter because it depends on your load case. If, you might get a perfectly good result if it's all axial load. Um, but that's a problem is you have to go check all your thin walled areas and make sure you have at least a couple elements through the thickness, which can be complicated on a, on a complicated part. Um, and then you also need to check for element shapes um, to see if there's any bad ones. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, okay, so often you will start with... Um, uh, a larger uh, assembly using beams. So, for example, for Baja, maybe you, you want to analyze your A arms or, or something like that. Um, you can start with beams everywhere. And let's say you have loads on the frame that are transferring your A arms or something like that. You can then get the input loads into your suspension using really simplified beam geometry everywhere. And then zoom in on your A arm and do a solid mesh of your A arm or something like that, right? So, um, in fact, SOLIDWORKS has something called submodeling, which I didn't really get into too much. 
um, you can do a sub modeling study where you run an analysis with multiple components and then you do a sub modeling. So let's, let's say it is, let's say it's a kingpin. You have a kingpin in the, and the A arms and you have the load on the kingpin. Cause that's where, you know, the loads coming in. Um, you could run an analysis of that whole thing together where you have loads just on the kingpin and then tell it to do a sub modeling, taking the, in, the loads from the kingpin and how they transfer to your A arm and just model the A arm using the input from uh, the previous analysis, basically. So that's what sub modeling is. Um, and you can also switch element type uh, in SOLIDWORKS. Um, even if you started off trying to do solid and realized, ah, I don't want to do solid anymore, I actually found a feature that you can treat it as a beam. Um, so you can actually change actually to shells and beams and stuff, even with solid geometry. Um, however, like I said before, if you didn't go in knowing that, you're going to have one long element, basically, that you can't put loads in the middle of it. So you have to split that into several bodies. So just some things to think about when you when you check check elements. And then here's the rule of thumb. Sorry, this is kind of the inverse of what I was saying before, the three to one, right? The three to one number is like right here. Um, so this is, again, the, the ratio, the thickness and the length ratio. Um, this is kind of just a rule guide where if it's thick, that means it's a good ratio to use by kind of bucket. And then this is not as useful. You're trying to get your time as well, so it means like never use it beyond this. This is kind of like showing right? So these thin, these are the thin, um, thin shells and, and beam elements. Um, and, and so this is, again, this is like two to one. This is a two to one ratio. Um, <coughs> So you can use thick shell and beams. You can see um, the, the beam elements kind of apply in a lot of places. Uh, the 3D elements here, you only want to use when you're getting up, you're getting down to these kind of ratios, right? Um, so this is saying like if you have a uh, a half inch, uh, half inch thick tube, if it's any longer than an inch long, it, it shouldn't be a solid mesh, right? Um, so you can take the inverse of these numbers and might make, might make it easier in your head to, to think of ratios. Um, I almost put that in this chart, but. Uh, for tubing, would you do like OD or thickness for the height here? Um, no, for the. Uh, Am I thinking this wrong? No, I would use uh, the like the thickness. wall thickness. Yeah. Okay, so meshing, uh, meshing is the process of creating nodes and elements to represent geometry. Um, so you can create a mesh uh, by starting with geometry, like a CAD model, or you can create a mesh from scratch. Um, this may not be applicable to SOLIDWORKS, but you can create a, a mesh from scratch just drawing nodes and elements, just like you would draw shapes in CAD. Um, so there's a bunch of different programs I've used where I just wanted to draw like I literally just created two nodes. I just put in an uh, X, Y, Z dimension of, of two nodes, connected them, and that's an element. And I just tell it what the cross-sectional area is. And what you can also do in some software is you can create a long, a long one and then just say split this into 10 elements, and I'll just make 10 elements for you. You can all, it's basically that tiny part. You can also uh, do linear, you know, at radial elements. You know, you can do patterns. Uh, you can copy and paste elements and where that's useful is like, let's say you have a, we do this quite a bit where we have a fitting that has a, a certain bond area, right? So, so maybe you have a, uh, a panel that's like pretty long and you, and you draw, you have like a aluminum fitting and like a bond line, right? So you, you bonded this here and you, you run some analysis and you find out, you know what, my bond line is not big enough. I don't have enough bond area, right? You go, okay, well, I could recad this, remesh it or whatever, or I'll just tell the element, uh, the final element model to copy, you know, these and paste it here. And now it thinks my bracket's this big. And you run that and you iterate in the finite element program until it says, okay, I started with a, a three inch long bracket and I needed a seven inch long bracket to get the, enough bond area. And now you just have to update your CAD once. So, well, so again, 
it's not the solver doesn't let you do this. It might. I haven't used it enough to know. But just remember, when you get to other, you using other software, there's more powerful things you can do, and not have to worry about changing your design, your CAD model until you're done iterating. So, but for most of the time, you guys are going to start with geometry, and you're going to turn that into a mesh. Um, so this is this is what the CAD will look like, and when we say mesh, you're, you're going to see the elements. Um, in this case, it looks. You know, you see kind of kind of in there, but really it's just the elements that you're seeing. Uh, and then in this case, this is what the elements will look like. So if you you have to turn on the properties to actually see what you what you told the computer to assume for an area. If you're just typing in areas. Okay, so I have four slides on meshing because this this can control your results um, quite a bit. So your mesh density will control how well the mesh you know, matches the actual model. Um, think of it like this, right? If you're trying to represent a circle, remember you're breaking that into small pieces, right? If you have a big mesh, you're gonna have this faceted circle, right? And you have straight lines everywhere. So it's, you know, if you had one element, it would look like a triangle, right? Instead of a circle, right? So, but then as you get finer and finer, it starts to look, you know, from far away, it starts looking like a circle again, right? So that's that's the difference between a coarse and a fine mesh, right? <clears throat> you remember you're approximating the geometry when you mesh it. Oh, and this will control directly correlates to how accurate your results are going to be. Um, remember they interpolate between nodes. So if you have results that are not linear between loads, you're not going to get you know correct results. So for example, this is a this is a whole, uh, analysis. This is a pin. Right, where you have a temperature here and a temperature varying denominator on each end of this pin. So this was if you were to test it and measure every single point, you would see this kind of curve. And when you do it, if you define an element model and you only have this many elements here, then remember they type it's all tracked as a node. The elements, they don't track anything over this area. It's it's just it's just regularly interpolating between that and the node. So you're gonna run a you're gonna run an FDA and it's gonna give you result at these nodes. And then it's going to interpolate. So instead of looking like this, you know, you're, you're seeing things like this, right? Now this is fine when you have something that actually is linear, but obviously around these curved areas, this this is wrong. If I was to pull this data point, it would be it would be different than this case, the actual one, right? <laughs> so if you know what this looks like, you want to make sure you have denser mesh in these nonlinear areas, and it's okay to have a coarser mesh, you know, in linear areas, but just keep that in mind as far as how the, the program works is um, larger meshes can lead to uh, more inaccuracies. <clears throat> okay, is this says mesh refinement. Um, so also remember that everything's calculated at the nodes, but there's elements that are sharing the node, right? And so elements might have different stiffnesses. You know, this has geometry changes, right? One, there might be a node that has uh, an element Stiffness and another element next to it. So what happens is they're arguing over what the stress should be at that node, right? He said, no, it should be deflecting this much because I'm not very stiff. And the other guy's, well, I'm stiff, so it shouldn't be deflecting that much. So what they do is they average out the stresses over all the elements that are touching it, and then they smooth it over. Um, so <clears throat> this is what it would look like. So most of the time you can see this. You're, you're going to see this, and if you don't turn your mesh on, which by the way, you know, I always recommend having the mesh on for the result. Like it might look nicer without the mesh, um, but it kind of gives you a better insight into what's going on, right? Like if this red was over one whole element, it might be fine. But this red is is over is over a couple of different elements, and if you take off the stress averaging, then you actually see what's happening. This this element saying I don't have much stress, and this one saying I have a lot of stress. Right, so there's a transition happening here. Something's happening here, and your mesh is too coarse to, to figure that out. And so, when you see something like this, you would want to refine this, and you want to basically have elements inside this red. And so, you you want the elements to be different. You want this to, you know, if you can see how this single element goes from green to red. You rather have this one kind of green, this one a little bit yellow, this one a little bit red. You want the elements to kind of blend like that, not within one single element. Uh, so you have to pay attention to that. <laughs> um, 
So finer mesh will lead to lesser discrepancies and elements arguing over what the nodal stress should be. Um, and so while you may not know where this happens, it'll definitely happen at, at load, where you put loads, where you put restraints, and at any sharp corners, right? Um, and then you can use mesh control to, to refine these areas. So you don't want to just say, oh, you know, I need my mesh to be a third of the size. So I'm going to just drag it first over and make my mesh everywhere a third denser or whatever, three times denser. You can pick the geometry in this region and tell it to have a higher, higher uh, density mesh in that area and let it transition to a, a, a coarser mesh where, you, you know, everything is blue. Everything's blue out here. It doesn't matter really the mesh size. The stress is the same throughout the, the rest of that part. Okay, so in general, you want to, you do want to start with a coarse mesh, just because it's gonna cost you a lot of time to to run your first model and then figure out something's wrong anyway. So run a, run a quick coarse mesh. Um, you might get some errors, which might tell you right away. Um, okay, I might have sharp corners. I might have some weird geometry that the computer doesn't like doing a coarse mesh. Um, and instead of just dragging it to finer, you might want to put a mesh control, which is a feature in SOLIDWORKS, on, on the region that you think is probably the, the trouble, trouble region. But start with the coarse mesh, uh, and then you, uh, you have to rerun it. If, you, if anyone's ever ran analysis once and used those results, it's wrong, right? It's potentially wrong. You need to find the convergence. So, so you run a coarse model, of course, mesh, um, you get your results, then you make it a, a little finer. Um, um, the thing that SOLIDWORKS has a drag bar, so it's kind of hard to say what a little bit finer is, but you know, I would say 10% uh, denser or something like that. Um, and then look at your results again, and you, gotta, you have to wait until it's converging, right? So, if you're, you know, if you're looking at stresses, that's, you know, 30 KSI or something like that. On your first run, you see 30 KSI, then you see 38, you know, then you see 40, then you see 40.5, you're can probably converged, right? So um, I think I might have a number in here later, I don't know, but um, it's good to plot it out quickly in Excel and just kind of get the pattern. But if you're seeing 30, and then 40, and then 49, right, and then 58, and then 68, and something's going on, you have, you're not converging. Um, and so what that might be is that there's a force applied at a node. Like at a, if you have a solid mesh and you have a, a force on a single node, it's infinite amount of stress basically on that part. So <clears throat> you get finer and finer and finer, it, start, it starts just giving you runaway stresses basically. Because um, you're giving it smaller and smaller areas over and as the thing gets finer. So um, it might be uh, the way you apply the force, there might be a sharp corner, you don't care about the corner, like I, I said earlier, you, you remove fillets. So that's gonna create sharp corners. And the reason you remove fillets, by the way, is so that when you do solid mesh, you don't, it's gonna have to put really fine mesh at the fillets, right? You have small radius. And so it's gonna screw up your mesh. You're gonna have weird transitions from large to small elements back to large. It's gonna add more elements than you need. So you wanna start without the fillets. And, you know, if it's an I-beam and you have fillets in the corner, you know, in the inside corners, you're probably not worried about the I-beam failing there, right? You're probably looking at something in the web or something like that. So even if you get a high stress concentration there, you might be ignoring that completely because you just know that's not the failure mode of the I-beam. Um, but that might be a reason you're not converging. So if you do have an I-beam and um, you're not converging, you're just looking at the max stress point. So if you have an I-beam, and we'll, we might actually see this in the case study. Uh, no, I'm going to run it live, so who knows what's going to happen. I'm going to do it live. <laughs> um, too young for that. <laughs> uh, so if, if you're going to get like stress concentrations here, but you're expecting the failure to be somewhere, you know, at, somewhere in the web here. Um, so it's going to keep telling you this, this this is not converging. It's going to get a higher and higher and higher stress. But maybe the stress where you expect the failure to be, let's just say for some reason it was here in this little section. Let's say this already converged, you know, five meshes ago. Then you're actually done, right? Because this is the area, you know, that you care about. 
So you can't just run it, like run it and just take the max stress because you have to understand if that's a real failure point or just a stress concentration. And uh, okay, if it was an area that you cared about, you go, you know what, I do think it might fail here. Then you either should leave the fillet in there if you know from the beginning, or if this made you think this might be a weak point, then put the fillet back in and suffer the consequence of doing a finer mesh and all the rest of that stuff. Okay, last thing on meshes. So if, if a mesh is distorted, right? Uh, so if, if the elements are distorted from their basic shape, you know, these ideal shapes, which I have, oh, great. This is, actually, let me just move this in real time because that'll help. Um, it has an ideal shape. Every time it changes from its ideal shape, you're gonna get less accurate results, okay? So you're gonna, if you have a near aspect ratio, if it starts to skew, if it starts to fever, or it has weird internal angles, um, it's going to give you uh, uh, improper results. And like an extreme case, if this tapers so much that it's like a triangle, it actually artificially stiffens your structure. Because when it's like this, you know, there's no shear support. Right? You get a parallel effect here. But if you make it a triangle, then it actually thinks your model is stiffer. And you actually see this in this, in this example, right? So these are just elements. So this is a good element, right? It looks just like the ideal element down here. Um, and then, and I don't know how they were forced to do this, but it, for this geometry, it shouldn't ever skew, but you could have some weird geometry that is trying to uh, combine meshes and it's going to start skewing. And, you know, this is the correct answer, let's just say, and now it's, it's way off, right? I mean, that's a big, that's a big difference, right? Um, and, and then down here, you get 0.16, right? I mean, you get you get a huge reduction. And again, this looks like a stiffer structure when you mesh it like this. To be honest, if you didn't do this, the the software tweaks the elements. But you have to check for this and say this doesn't look like a good element. <clears throat> um, and yeah, your results will vary quite a bit. And this is called uh, they have things to to quantify this. It's called the Jacobian value. Um, so you want to check this uh, if if SolidWorks does this. Um, most programs will give you a Jacobian value where uh, a perfect one is 1.0. So like anything less than that is bad. Um, and SolidWorks will check this, your mesh quality for you. Uh, um, you can even view a plot of mesh qualities, um, and you can get a summary report. So you should always do this. Um, by the way, this well uh, this applies when you do solid meshing, right? Um, when you do beam elements and stuff like that, this doesn't apply because it's not making 3D meshing, right? So, um, so you want to get at least 90% uh, of your elements with an aspect, aspect ratio less than three, okay? Um, and preferably nothing has an aspect, aspect ratio greater than 10. Um, that's kind of a, a goal um, based on some research um, that you should shoot for. Um, and I'll show an example of this, I, um, I think, in the case study. Oh, and then you can see it here. So you, you can do this check behind me, but you can also check your geometry, right? This is a good, this is good, right? You have, you have these ideal shapes that are turning and keeping their, keeping their shape. Or this one, maybe you had a mesh control here where you made this a lot denser for some reason. And, and so now it's making a coarse mesh to a fine mesh, and it's really screwing, screwing up your, your mesh. Uh, qu quality. Okay. Um, you know, some downsides to the FEA, right? I mean, they're all, it's approximate solutions, which I talked about, right? I mean, you're approximating geometry, you're approximating displacements, right? So just remember, you're just getting a, a general approximation of, uh, of the results. Um, this is like the biggest problem with FEA is that Valid results, I call it. You can, anyone can get results, but valid results, something that's useful for you as an engineer that's close to correct, is highly dependent on user input and your interpretation okay, of that. Just like I said with the I-beam, you, you might say that I-beam is going to fail because look at my stresses, but it's actually in that corner, and it never fails at that corner in any test that you do. So it's your interpretation of the results that FEA is giving you. Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned when I started this, 
I kind of wasn't, I really wasn't joking. If you don't understand statics or strength of materials, you're not qualified to be running FEA, right? So uh, you might be able to learn how to click the buttons and do it, but you're not going to be able to interpret it. You're not going to be able to, to run it properly, um, at least not as a student. If you somehow learn through work and you had some mentor showing you, then maybe. But for most people in this room, if you haven't taken those classes, it's fine to start learning how to do the programming, but you need to understand these fundament all of these fundamentals first. Um, we talked about how it, it solves at the node and interpolates over the element size. So any, that, that's also uh, something to keep in mind. Poor quality mesh while having accurate results. You need to be really careful with fixed supports as well. Um, so it will, it will prevent the Poisson ratio effect, right? Um, and lead to singularities, right? So, you know, you have a beam and you fix, if you did a solid mesh of like a beam and you fix the bottom face, so all the nodes are now fixed and they can't move at all. And then you pull on this beam, well, it wants to shrink, right? Because the Poisson, you know, Poisson's ratio. So it won't let you do that. So you're going to get even more stresses at the base. Um, but when you have like a beam element, that's not a problem because it's, it's, a, it's a node. Uh, it's not, you're not doing a whole surface and, and preventing it from doing that. So um, be careful when you do fixed reports. I, I have a whole thing on boundary conditions. Most students that I see, most of the biggest errors I see is anywhere the, the part they're, they're doing analysis on touches something else, it's a fixed constraint. Like fix it, it's a fixed constraint, right? And that's, that's also fundamentally wrong. Uh, you'll get totally wrong answers that way. Um, and then you also can get pivot errors, um, even if you uh, have balanced forces. So if you have a simple, simply supported beam, for example, um, where you only have forces going down, if, if you don't constrain it like in and out, you know, where there's no loads, you're gonna get errors, right? Um, because it, it just has, it just can't solve that because you need to have zero displacement, in, you know, in those directions, even though there's no force going in that direction. So you're going to, you might get an error that says that excessive pivot, uh, error or something like that. And that's because, uh, you just didn't constrain it properly. Um, uh, oh, and then we, I didn't talk too much about nonlinearity, but, um, I guess I was supposed to put that as a bullet point, but I have a chart for it. Um, yeah, remember it's it's a linear analysis. Unless you're choosing nonlinear, where it will take into account yielding and stuff like that, most of the time you're nonlinear. So, you know, you're gonna see. Um, let's say you have a part that is yielding. The actual stress in that part is not that high because it starts to yield, right? So if it's on this curve, this last, you know, the the nonlinear part of the curve, this is the actual stress you're gonna see in the part. But the FEA is going to tell you the stress is way up here because it doesn't know that it's yielding, right? It thinks it's, it's still super stiff and that it's, it's going to take the stress all the way up to here. So you don't actually say this part's going to fail because look, it's above, you know, it's above. It's, but actually, it didn't fail because it, it just yielded, right? So keep that in mind is that this is, it's, it's linear. Um, okay, so boundary conditions, right? This is super important. Applying the appropriate Boundary condition, yeah, I think this is the one of the biggest errors I see in students doing this. Um, the wrong boundary condition gives you the wrong result. It's that simple. Don't fix apart everything that it interfaces to, okay? You need to understand the actual degrees of freedom of that part. Um, you want to make sure all degrees of freedom of a rigid body are constrained, like I just talked about, but not unnecessarily constrained. Do not over-constrain it, right? So the FAA will give you a warning if you under-constrain it, like I just mentioned. It's not going to tell you that it's over-constrained because the blessing and curse of FEA is it can solve indeterminate problems, right? So it's going to give you the answer, even though the part's probably not constrained properly. Um, constraints are applied to nodes. <clears throat> uh, so for solid mesh, it, um, this is another thing to remember. Um, I don't know if I have this in here, but solid mesh, so for a solid mesh, the nodes translate. They can't rotate. They just translate. So they have three degrees of freedom. So solid mesh has three degrees of freedom. Um, when you do beam, like solid elements, it has six degrees of freedom at the node. So you can constrain six degrees of freedom. But for a solid mesh, it, has, it just has three degrees of freedom. So if you fix, if you do fix, you're fixing all just translations of nodes. So if you pick like the bottom edge of a, 
if you had a, uh, a square beam that went into the page, right? And you're like, well, I'm gonna fix, I want to fix this, but not the whole face. Maybe I'm worried about Poisson's ratio, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix this bottom edge right here, and you just fix that, right? Well, all that's doing is preventing those nodes from translating, but it can rotate, right? It's gonna be under constraint. You're gonna get an error because it's gonna be able to spin about that line, right? Because the nodes can't rotate. You're not, you're not, you're not constraining rotations of nodes, so you have to. Uh, also, you know, the best thing would be to also fix this up here or something like that, right? If you fix something and then nodes right above it, then you're also going to get really high stresses here. So it's a small area to react that around, right? So you're essentially not using this geometry anymore as, as your support. So um, just remember when, when you fix a solid mesh, you're fixing nodes, and for solid mesh, there's only three constraints, um, and they can still rotate. For uh, plates and beams, it's six degrees of freedom. So you can fix. So if you did that plate again, really, if this was a 1D, you would have a, a node in the center, right? Because it just knows the geometry. So yeah, this you can control the six degrees of freedom. That's the other beauty of doing the beam, the 1D mesh, is that you can just give it exactly what degrees of freedom you want, you want that end to be, and not have to worry about having a whole solid face and figuring out how to actually constrain that part. And this might make sense on the next slide. Okay. Okay. So this is for if you have plates or beams where um, the nodes have six degrees of freedom. I thought I wrote this down. I'll, I'll, I'll try and edit this and make sure that's obvious. Um, so it's obvious from this view. So this is how it works. Um, so if you're when you go to a constraint, and I, I use this reference geometry, I like using that because you can just put your six degrees of freedom in and understand it, as opposed to saying, um, you know, trying to figure out on a flat face how many degrees of freedom you want. I just pick the nodes that I want ahead of time, or I pick a face ahead of time, when we go in this box, and then you pick this direction. So if you pick like its vertical axis, that's what it's using as like vertical. Um, and so if you're constraining something, you put a zero here. You're saying it can't move. Like these are grayed out. This, this means it can move. You need to activate that cell, and you put a zero in there. She means it can't move in that direction. You can remember that formula, right? Force equals KB. You can also put it, if you don't know the forces, let's, let's say you had a beam and you, you had some weight on it. You had no idea how, big, how heavy that weight was, but you had a measurement of the deflection on that beam. You can put the deflection in instead, and it'll give you the stress. Um, so put a zero anywhere you want to constrain it. Uh, okay, so for plates and beams, you're going to see six of these because they have, they have six degrees of freedom. Okay, so you have to do translations and rotations. So if you do fixed geometry, you're going to fix this. this. So these are, uh, this is obvious. So this is, this option is if you choose reference geometry. These are the standard ones you can just click. And that you won't see this window at all. So when you click this, it's automatically putting zeros in here for you everywhere. Okay. So this is like the shortcut to, to do that. I like to do it myself so I fully understand the constraint that I'm putting on it. But you can use these if you know what you're doing. So fixed geometry, it's going to fix six degrees of freedom. It's going to put zeros in all of these for you. Okay. That looks like you can basically like a cantilever beam, right? That's a fixed support on the end. Um, if you pick Immovable, no translation, it's going to put a zero in each translation, zero, zero, zero. Okay, that's like a pin constraint. So it's going to look like you know a pinned beam. If you do a roller slider, that's obvious, it looks like a roller slider. It's one degree of freedom. It can only constrain up and down. So it's going to put a zero here. That's all it's going to do. Um, and then you have this fish hinge. <laughs> Which constrains five degrees of freedom. Basically, unless you rotate uh, about one of, the, one, of, one of these, will not be everything is going to say zero except for like one of these, uh, depending on what space you chose. Um, and this this is uh, useful for Baha formula because this is like a clevis joint, right? This is this is like where suspension goes into the frame, right? You can use a fixed hinge in that case, um, and that's what this looks like here. This is the highlighted fixed hinge. Any questions on that? Because boundary conditions are 
the bread and butter of running a proper analysis. Um, okay, so this is solid mesh. So it's the same thing, but if I do a solid mesh, you will know that there's no rotations here. Right? It just gives you transition all up. Okay. Um, so if you do fixed geometry, what's it going to do? It's going gonna, it's gonna to fix just the translations. Okay. Um, now, if you if you do the whole face, it'll look like this. If I give you a little bit of a warning, I think I might have said that here. That's what this note says, but I just threw that. Um, if you if you do this just to a line, it's not going to look like a cantilevered beam like that, okay? Or just to a single node, you have to do it to a face to actually get it to be fixed, or multiple nodes. Immovable. These are exactly the same if you have a solid mesh, because this is going to translate. This is going to do no translation. You get a, that's the same thing as fixed. Um, so actually. Uh, so it fully constrains. I should have changed. I meant to change this uh, picture. Actually, um, it, it's the same thing. It fully constrains three degrees of freedom. Um, so really, what happens is what you're selecting will de determine if it's a pin or a beam. If you're selecting a face, or you're selecting an edge, or a single node, will change what this looks like. Probably this won't change anything in solid mesh. You'll get the same results between these two. <coughs> Um, roller slider same is the same thing though. It's one degree of freedom, um, and then uh, fixed hinge. And again, this you need to make sure this is applied to a cylindrical face to make sure it's a, a hinge. My other warning here says, uh, yeah, that's right. If you were trying to pin something, so you can get a lot of. Okay, you can see why some of the can be a problem. If you were trying to create this and you pin an entire face, you select an entire face, and you hit pin, you actually created this constraint. Because you're, you're pinning multiple nodes on a face, and now they can't rotate, because the, in order to rotate, the upper nodes have to move relative to the bottom nodes, and you're fixing all of them. And so, again, this will decide, this depends on what geometry you choose um, in solid meshing. Okay, interpreting results. Um, out of the people, who's, who's run analysis in here before? How many of you guys use von Mises? Is that what you look at? Yeah. Okay. And why do you look at von Mises? Yeah, pretty much. You guys remember, what, what is von Mises stress? Okay. Understood. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but you know, yeah. there's different stresses to look at. You know, von Mises, you know, it's a way to look at combined stresses. Basically, it takes the stresses and says, this is the stress if you were just to pull on on this member in an axial load. That's just that's the equivalent stress you're going to see. Okay, with these forces, that's what it's telling you. That's what basically von Mises is, right? Now, it's fine to look at that, and it, it's it's fine to use that as a failure criteria. But don't always just look at that, because um, it's good to understand the difference between bending uh, and axial and shear, because it might change the way you want to modify your part. If you if you do an I beam model, for example, and you and you just look at von Mises and you go, oh, my von Mises stress, you know, I'm I'm near yield right now. I need to what do I need to do? Do you need to make the area bigger? Is it a shear? Is it a shear problem? Do you need to make you know it deeper? Because it's a bending problem, you have no insight into that, right? So, if you should look a little bit deeper into the results and, and plot more than just von Mises. Uh, and a, a useful thing to plot is strain. Also, just look at just looking at the strain plots will also help you sometimes. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Sometimes you need to ignore um, elements with high peak stresses. I think we talked about that. Um, this happens a lot in your bolt holes. We see this a lot um, when we're because we model all our bolts, and you'll see hot spots right around the edge of the bolt hole. Right, you'll see a lot of stresses, and typically, you know, without batting an eye, we ignore the first row of elements, and you know that's just a high stress concentration. And we look at the stresses an element beyond that, and say that's more realistic. The other reason is, especially if you're using elastic material, is 
Well, it's going to want to yield. Like if you see a high stress and the element behind it does not have much stress, it's going to want to yield and it's going to, you know, the other elements are not going to want to yield, right? And so to, to yield, the material has to go somewhere, right? And so it's actually reinforced by the other elements, right? So you have to be able to understand what's a real and artificial stress concentration. Can you talk about that a little bit more? How do you, how do you know if it's, a, if it's real or if the stress concentration is just from the FDA? Well, you, uh, like I said, you want to look at the elements right outside of the red elements. Gotcha. Okay. So, so if it, one yeah, if it's like, uh, sort of like what we saw in that other example, um, actually, I don't know that this, this is a good one because it, it has a bunch of them, but like if, if this, um, if this one's red, all these are blue around here, you know, closer to blue like that, and something's going on in that one region, um, yeah, like you shouldn't really see that. You should see a blend into that stress. Um, also, just just from experience, from knowing, um, I'm going too far here. Um, when you run a bunch of analysis, you're always going to see stresses in bolt holes and stuff like that, and you never see failures in that in in that in, in practice, right? Um, yeah, anywhere there's actually going to be a fillet. So other, other times you ignore it is because you know there's actually more material there than what's modeled. Um, and uh, anywhere you might have a, like you might have a load in an area that you know it's not going to fail in that one area. But just the way you're putting the load into the, the FEA, it creates like a high stress concentration. Um, but maybe you just care about the stress, you know, at, at the root of something, even though the load's at the tip and it looks like a high stress there. You just know from practice the beam's not going to fail at, over there. It's going to fail over here or something like that, right? So, but I mean, it is. It can be more art than science. Yeah. Trying to figure that out. And I guess those points, if you change the mesh size, they should be changing quite a bit. Yeah, they're all the kind of like art. So, I guess that would be like one. That's another way. I mean, one thing I can see happen to them is they'll they'll see these points and they're going to be changing their mesh and they're going to be uh, and they're going to be seeing their high their peak stress like go down and down and down right right basically so yeah I, yeah so. i mean yeah again you need to pay more attention to uh don't just look at the max stress result because yeah maybe the area that's actually failing the stress hasn't changed at all right um and you're just you're just weeding out the stress concentration and making it more realistic as you refine it um and especially if you like went to iterate like okay let me change my model and you did a finer mesh size and a different model, you don't know if your results, especially if you didn't check that it converged, right? If you can check for convergence first, then good, right? But it might have been more that the, the mesh changed because your geometry changed and your, your mesh is finer, and it's not a better design, it's just a better mesh, right? Um, so yeah. Um, okay, I understand, I think we just talked about yielding, it's gonna distribute stresses. Uh, so, and sometimes yielding is not a sign of maybe, you know, it's fine to yield. You have to know when yield is actually a problem and when it's not. Okay. Bolt yielding is sometimes not a problem at all if you don't care about things gapping, right? Um, so, um, uh, if, you're, if your results converge and you're within 10% of hand calcs, um, then your model should, should be good, pretty good. Um, and now I put an asterisk there because obviously if you could do everything by hand, you wouldn't be doing the FEA, but you need to do some kind of check when I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit to make sure your model is actually running properly, um, with some kind of hand calc, some kind of sanity check. Um, if FEA is linear, okay, you can scale results. Okay. So, um, and FEA is linear. Now it depends. It could, there could be things that don't make it linear. Um, uh, depending on if you don't load it properly um, or you have large displacements and it's not really linear. But um, for example, if you, um, maybe I'll show this in one of my other one, in, an example, but if you run uh, an analysis and you wanna know how much load you can put on something, right? And so you put 50 pounds on a beam and you, and you see the stress is 20 KSI and you know you could go up to 30 KSI. Don't go, okay, let me put 60 pounds on it and then see what the stress is. Let me put 70, let me put 80. Oh, 80 is too much, let me put 75. 
you have 50 KSI, I mean, you have 50 pounds and you have 20 KSI, you just scale the 50 by the ratio of 30 over 20. 30 is their stress goal, right? So it's linear. So a lot of times we do a unit load. So you want to know how much, how much force something can handle? You put one pound of force on it in FEA. That's all you need. Put one pound of force, you get the unit force and the unit stress, and then you just multiply that out to get this, you know, the, till you reach the stress that you can handle. So don't waste time rerunning models when understand that FEA is linear. And if it's not linear, something might be wrong in your model. So you can do it. That's another way to check it is to put, put 10 pounds on it, then put 100 pounds on it, and you should have 10 times the stress, exactly 10 times the stress. Okay. Um, and then change contour plots to help visualize what you really care about. If you have this high stress concentration and, and you're getting a red, you know, actually I have an example here to show you. You're getting a red spot somewhere. It's, it might be masking the rest of it um, that you care about because it might be such a high stress that it's red and the rest is basically blue. But if you ignore the red, then you see another, you know, gradient in the blue that's actually more reds and greens and yellows. Um, so you can change the contour plots in SOLIDWORKS to be wh whatever range you want. And you should spread it out and shrink it as needed to, to see what you, know, what you care about. Okay, you can use FEA for optimizing designs, right? There's actually a feature called uh, Design Insight, um, which I think you can only do with solid mesh, so that's actually a, a bonus for using solid mesh. And that's what this is here. So you go to Design Insight, and then you can just scroll this. And basically, when you uh, put this all the way to one side, it's just going to show you, it's basically the strain plot of like all the, this is where all the fluid is, right? It's, it's kind of like scaling this fluid back and seeing what areas are highly, you know, stresses go down. So it's, it's basically telling you in this picture, right? It's like, I'm going to all the way to the right, the whole thing's going to be blue. I'm going to all the way to the left, the whole thing's going to be clear, right? And so you can kind of drag this, it's almost like slowly applying the load, right? And so you can see, like, this is doing most of the work, right? Which makes sense. It wants to be like a trust, right? And I just have a little bit, right? So it says, oh, I'll leave that material, I'll leave this material, this material, right? So you can use that, um, not blindly, just understand and make sure you understand how it's being used. But this is just doing the same thing of looking at a strain plot, which is what I like to do. Um, and so this is the same model, the same, this is actually the same thing that was run. I use design intent or I just output the strain instead. And uh, you can see we're going to start blue with an ideal strain, right? So the dark blue is going to correlate with the clear here, right? So you can get rid of this section, get rid of this corner. Uh, there's the dark blue in the middle, there's the dark blue here. So it's basically kind of dumbing the, the strain plot down for you. But understand that you can use the strain. If another uh, software doesn't have this design insight, look at the strain plot and see where there's no strain in your part and just remove their material, right? Remove it and rerun it, and, and your stresses will probably be the same if you did it right. Okay, doing quick iterations. Um, so in, in some so software, I think I've talked about this a bunch already, you can, you can just type in the beam properties, which is what I like doing. Um, you can do super quick iterations. You don't even have to know how you create that geometry. You can just change the inertia and solve, basically solve for inertia. And then you can decide how do you want to get that inertia most efficiently through a, a, a circle, through a square, through an I-beam, right? So unfortunately, I don't think SOLIDWORKS lets you do that. But um, the same thing can be done with the shell man using shells. So in that example where I, I made this a shell, initially I said, um, There's an option here, um, I think that says use uh, use CAD. There's like an option that says use CAD. So it'll just take the CAD geometry and make it the thickness. But then you can just start with that. You can just type it in later and change it. So you go, you know what? This wasn't good enough. I want to double my width thickness or, or any whatever. You can just go in and change that. And see, you can see here, uh, the, here's the flanges and this is the web. And you can make a group, so that's why this is a group. Any anything in that group is going to have this thickness. You can also change material on it if you need to. So you don't have to go back and redraw anything and remesh it. You literally are just typing in numbers and rerunning it. 
So that's another advantage to doing beams I mean, over solid mesh. You can't do anything like that with solid mesh. Okay. <clears throat> Let's say you magically are able to get a good result. Because <laughs> by now you probably think there's no way I'm ever going to get a good result. Um, which means I did my job. Uh, so I see a lot, and I've been to a lot of senior design presentations, and I was advisor for a couple of projects, and and I hear professors whisper whenever people show FDA results. And most of the time, it's a picture with colors on it and a number that says factor safety. Like that's what they're presenting. We did analysis. Here's a picture with color, red and greens and blues. And our factor safety is 2.5. Go team. And we go to the next slide. Okay, that's a terrible way to present results. Okay. Um, so here's how you should be doing it. And I'll go to an example in a second. Okay. You need a list your materials and your properties up front. Don't just say I'm using aluminum 6061. Say I'm, I'm using it and the yield stress is 30 KSI. That's why I assume whatever it is. Um, so make sure, I mean, you don't have to put every material property, put the ones that matter for the analysis. Your modulus, don't forget modulus, okay? Modulus elasticity, put that down, put down the yield uh, and potentially the ultimate. Um, if you're, it, you know, I would just put all three of those down every time, no matter what. And then if you're showing mass or something, you know, put your density. Um, okay, you need to show and explain your boundary conditions. Okay, because like I said, that'll change everything. I can't tell if your results are good or not unless you show me how you've constrained your model. Same with the load case. Okay, how do you apply the loads? Um, show the image of the meshed geometry with no color scale. Okay, just the mesh. Um, this will let people see how the quality of your mesh and also include the table that SOLIDWORKS will output for you that summarizes the, the mesh quality. And I have an example of that. Then you can show your contours that you're used to showing, uh, explain any areas that you might be ignoring, and then zoom in on the high stress area. Don't show this big picture with this small red dot. You know, if you have the red dot, zoom in on it and say, here's, you know, here's the area. This is, we, believe the weak point this is you know this is what's limiting our, our design and this this is where our lowest factor safety is um you want to show deflected and non-deflected models seeing the model deflect will give you a lot of insight into how it was constrained if it was constrained properly by the way you should be looking at this Im immediately before you even look at stress results you should be looking at how it deflected because that'll tell you real quick if you did something wrong in your pandemic conditions um so you want to show it exaggerated you should also put that in your slide, which I actually didn't do myself. Like this is a 10 to one scale because it's hard to tell. And actually some people might think it's actually deflecting that much, right? Um, and the best way is to embed the animation that SOLIDWORKS does into your PowerPoint. So you actually have a GIF of it moving. But if you don't have that, uh, it can add to your file size too. Um, put non-deformed and deformed. In some cases you can superimpose it uh, on each other, okay? Um, this is just like a nitpicky thing. I use the plain white backgrounds like in SOLIDWORKS. I mean, especially I'm assuming your background's plain white. Uh, it just looks, it can get real messy um, to have like the great gradients and different colors when I mean, you just want the geometry, you know what I mean? Um, so that's more nitpicking stuff, but trying to use plain, change the SOLIDWORKS to plain white background. Uh, so it just looks better in your PowerPoint. Um, there's also a report option in SOLIDWORKS. So you can export a report um, and it'll do a lot of this for you. It'll give you a materials box. It'll give you the contour plots. It'll give you displacement plots. So you can do an export and then uh, put that into a PowerPoint. You have to clean it up a little bit probably. So let's see what that looks like, okay. All right, I just pretended I did a kingpin analysis, right? Um, no, I'm assuming ahead of this, you've already explained your design, you've explained where the loads are coming from, right? You know, why you're choosing that load and how, you know, so this is just, now you're in the analysis section, you jump to it. Okay, so right away I put my properties in here. This is the material. Um, this is the, the failure, the stress mode that I was looking at. Uh, by the way, this comes right from the SOLIDWORKS report, this box. Um, here's my modulus, my strength, um, you know, the picture of the CAD. Uh, so some of this we didn't, you don't need, but it, it's fine if you're just copying the box. Um, 
Okay, now you showed your load and your boundary condition. Notice I'm not showing results. I'm just showing the setup to the model, okay? So um, this isn't proper, by the way. I just did an example. I'm not saying if you have a module, you should be fixed. I'm just, this is just a quick thing to do. So uh, make sure your term terminology is correct. You know what fixed means. And it's probably better to call it degrees of freedom actually. So you would say like six degrees of freedom restraints or something like that. Um, so you tell everyone where it's fixed, show them, you know, this is what it looks like in software, so you turn on all your stuff. You know, I would just assume you have a distributed load over this uh, spindle. Um, so show that um, and uh, explain kind of your forces. Okay, and then I show the mesh, okay? So I said it's a solid mesh. Now this is the mesh detail. from uh, SOLIDWORKS. So here's my mesh. Uh, is this a good mesh or bad mesh? Who knows? Anyone know if this is a good mesh or bad mesh? Look at how many elements, what percent of elements I have a less than perfect ratio. I don't appreciate you to memorize it. I just presented it, but I said 90% or more, right? This is a bad mesh, okay? Only 40% of my elements have a decent aspect ratio. And they're supposed to have no elements over 10. Well, I'm close, you know, this is a percentage, so only 0.9%, right? Um, um, and then this, I think, uh, percent of the spray element, I think this is anything that has a really bad Jacobian. But I, I honestly don't know how SolidWorks are doing Jacobian because it, uh, it seems to look at aspect ratios a lot better than I couldn't actually get a Jacobian number out of it. Um, so, but someone maybe you can, you guys can figure that out. So this isn't a stress plot. This is my mesh plot. I said you can pop your mesh. This is the aspect ratio. So uh, again, you want things less than three. Okay. I want things that are dark blue is a good mesh. Okay. Anything over yellow is terrible. Um, and so you can see here. Oh, look, it's, it's right where I have this really sharp corner going to the two is where I have really bad elements. Okay. Now, I know I don't care about that because we're not having a load, right? I'm not expecting it to fail here. I'm expecting it to fail here. So maybe it's okay to leave. Um, but you could also go in and you could like chamfer this. If that was a problem. You could refine, you could select this edge and this edge and make it a, uh, a denser mesh in that area and keep messing around until you're getting 90 in here. Um, but no one's going to know that. If I just showed that picture, you wouldn't have even probably thought this was a bad mesh, right? It actually looks pretty even and everything, right? But that's because this is actually two pieces, and so that's actually a good mesh up there. Um, so you should be showing this so you can show people your mesh quality. And then here's the results. Um, so I have my von Mises stress, um, my, uh, my yield strength, um, and my factor of safety. Note that I copy the con the contour plot just like this one. I didn't uh, change anything. It can be hard to read if you just take a snapshot. It's ours. I wanted to picture. So I actually take a picture of the contour separately and paste it in here so you can see nice and big what the numbers are, and then you can take you know pictures of the CAD. These are two different images. Um, you sh you should always show where the max is. Um, you should add a conclusion that says, is this factor, you know, don't just put a factor of safety. Why is 11.4 good or bad? Um, it, and also, you know, is this good, in, is this too, um, too good of a part? Do I need to lightweight it, right? Um, so add some kind of conclusion to, to the model, or I mean, to your, to your slide and the results. And then this is the animated, so you can just get this from SolidWorks. Um, so now people can see, right? I mean, you can see like, it's, over constrained really because I, I mean this is all fixed in here and stuff like that um, but this gives you an idea of where the stresses should be how the parts moving and stuff like that um, other optional stuff to show um, any stresses over a certain I kind of showed this mostly so you could see some other features in SolidWorks um, so I have to use a really small load so these factor savings are kind of high but uh, you could just teach us in here. Uh, there's a piece of SOLIDWORKS where you can set a threshold. So you can say, SOLIDWORKS, only show me anything that has a factor of safety less than 
whatever number you want. Plus it's lambda so high, it less than 2.8. So it clears out anything that doesn't have a factor safety lower than that, and it's only showing me that. So I can see, and look, this helps me see inside the part, right? In the other one, you can even see the stress in here. It looks blue if you're looking at the outside. Don't forget that it's a cross, there's a cross section in there you have to look at. Um, so you can do little filters like that where you, where, you know, maybe it's three. Anything over under three is going to be bad. And you can see where it turns three. And this is the change in the contour, right? So you can do several things to this. Um, what I did was, uh, it's a similar thing to this. I just said, I'm going to filter this out. That anything that has less than a factor safety of 15.2 is red. And everything else is blue. And the way I did that was I figured out what 15.2, you know, whatever you're trying to do, you just set the stress levels to be that. You can see how it's, it's only a small difference between the blue and the red. That's how you get uh, this big difference in, in colors is that normally the stress plot will be something like, you know, 30 KSI uh, down to, you know, this is orders of magnitude less, right? Um, oh, I need to plug in. Uh, so these are other things you can like, you don't necessarily need to show in a presentation. I kind of put this on to show you other, uh, other things you can do to interpret your results a little bit better. And it's kind of cool design features you can use. Um, again, if this was a high stress concentration, you could set this to where it would ignore that completely. And you only show stresses under a certain range. And then instead of being blue like this, you know, you like if you wanted, if you wanted to see a more distribution, you care more about this part, you would you would set thresholds like a high threshold here and a low threshold here. Now anything with that stress is red. And anything here is blue, and you'll see a, a different shade in there, right? I hope you found this. Okay, we're getting in the end. Does the, oh, there you go. Does the um, elastic modulus affect your stress results in any way yeah. using FDA? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is that artificial or is that mm -hmm. real though? That's real. Remember what the. Uh, so um, I'll actually, I, I think I have this point somewhere else. Um, so remember what the uh, stiffness matrix is, right? It's EA over L. Yeah. So that directly correlates with stress. So if you have uh, the main point to this, you know, the, why that's important is I talked about linearly scaling stuff, right? So if you have a stress, let's say 3, 30 KSI, you could say, well, let me choose a material that has higher than 30 KSI. I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it to steel. And you just take the stress that you get from this model and compare it to the steel's uh, yield strength. It's not going to be right because the steel has a different modulus. So you're going to get a higher stress with steel, right? Your modulus is going to go up. And so you have to re. You can't linearly scale material properties in FEA. You have you have to rerun it with the right modulus. Uh, and then figure out the factor of safety again. You might be able to like actually scale using modulus to scale, uh, but that's a little bit more complicated, I think. I don't know. I haven't actually ever tried that. Are stresses ever material stiffness dependent, actually, or or is that just an artifact? No, they are. In most times, if you solve for like a bending stress or a shear stress or a normal stress, you would never normally you would not need the elastic modulus to solve for that with a hand calc. Um, you're talking about like MC over I. Yeah, it's um, MC over I or sig or F over A or. Yeah. Um, yeah, but let's see. The only one is contact stresses that you usually mm -hmm. do elastic. Modulus. I mean, you're gonna get um because you have. This the stiffness matrix definitely is, is how they run this, right? So you're gonna yeah, it's definitely in there. you can do that. Um, you're um, I have to I have to think about about that. Um, you're gonna you're gonna get different stresses. Um, I think maybe just because that's a uh, yeah. I mean that's another thing about that. 
Maybe, yeah, maybe. I mean, there might just be, a, a, you know, simplified hand equations that <clears throat> when you do el different elements, you need the stiffnesses to. And it might just be more complicated geometries. Maybe the stiffnesses begin to matter. But right. When you do hand calcs, the geometries are simple enough that it turns out the stiffnesses aren't really important. Right. Idea. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to look into that one a little bit more. Okay, um, here's here's some final tips, okay? This is a dense topic, obviously, right? And I hope not too many of you guys are super lost, um, but I hope you use this um, in the presentation in the future and I can get it to everybody here. Um, so <clears throat> we haven't talked about this yet, and, and I'm gonna walk through some stuff, you know, it depends on how late people wanna stay, but I'm, I'm gonna do the case studies for people that wanna stay and I can do some of this stuff, which is run modal analysis, which you probably don't even know what that is, but you know, understanding the first mode of structures is, is very important. Um, that's a whole side topic, but if you run modal analysis, um, it'll help you understand the model a lot better and your designs a lot better. You can also flush out boundary condition issues. So let's say you run it and it says excessive pivot, pivot ratios. You're like, I thought I constrained everything. You know, what's going on? Since it doesn't run during static, you can't see like what, what the part falling off, you know, your screen saying, oh, I didn't constrain it in this direction, right? So you, you should run a modal analysis. You have the same constraints. And you don't need any forces to run the modal analysis. So you just make sure your constraints are the same. You have to start a new model. You have to start a new FDA. So you would go back to your time and say, your modal analysis is you have to reapply your constraints. So make sure you do the same exact constraints. I don't know if you're going to copy across analysis in SOLIDWORKS. So you do your constraints and then you run a modal analysis. You don't need any forces. And if you get zero hertz modes, that means you're not constrained in that direction. Okay. So if you, if, if you didn't constrain anything, um, you just literally had an I beam floating there, and you run a modal analysis. You're going to get six zero hertz modes, one for every degree of freedom. You're going to see six modes that are. It's, it's not going to say zero with that. It's going to say so. I'm not going to be negative, which don't even make sense mathematically. So it's going to say negative point oh five, whatever. You're going to see ten decimal places and and basically zero. Um, and then the seventh mode will be its first natural mode of, of a free free beam. I'm getting kind of dense into some of those topics, but so you're actually going to see you'll, you'll go zero 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 for six zeros, and then you're going to see like 120 hertz, right? And you're like, what the heck? That's a super stiff beam. Why am I getting? It just means you didn't constrain it, but it literally has no stiffness in that direction. So that's going to be the first mode. So what you can do is if you run it. However many zero modes you get, that's how many degrees of freedom you get into the strain. So if you get one zero hertz mode, and then you get a, a 12 or three, or just anything that's obviously not a, a, a rounding error close to zero, then uh, that's, that's the degree of freedom you're missing, right? And then the good thing is it'll show you that. So if you have a beam, and like the example I had before, where you wanted to fix the edge, but you, you, you fix an edge, but it can actually rotate about it, you're gonna see a, a zero mode that goes like this and the beam's gonna swing, like it's hanging from its support. And you're gonna know right away, oh, this thing can rotate about this point, okay? And so it's super simple to run, you just need the constraints, run it. I actually couldn't find a way to get more than five modes out of SolidWorks. Normally you can say, I want the first 20 modes. So um, I only got, I could only find five, I don't know how to change it but I didn't spend too much time. Um, so if you happen to have six zeros, you, know, I mean, you have to start whittling them down until you finally get at least less than five. Um, so that's a good way. And it can also find weak parts in the design. So you, you might actually have uh, ran it just fine and had a good factor of safety. Um, but you might want to just see like, well, you know, where could I reinforce this? I think maybe my load might load later or something. The road over your first mode is, that's the weakest part, right? So if you get an I beam, right, your first mode is not going to be bending about the web, right? That's the stiffest. That's going to that's be, you know, uh, a, a much lower mode. You're going to see it bending about, about the, you know, vertical direction or twisting, right? And so you can see the weak parts of a of geometry by doing a modal analysis. Um, okay. Yeah. 
Now, you, this is kind of more for non-SolidWorks stuff because if you're using your solid model, it's going to match, except maybe if you change the shell mesh, but you should check the mass of your FEM, okay? So in some cases, let's say you're drawing sketches and you just manually put in the, the beam number, the beam, um, and it's 130 pounds, but your CAD model is like 60 pounds, you probably somehow typed in the wrong geometry or something like that, okay? Um, it may not apply so much to SOLIDWORKS because I think you're going to use your CAD, but it's still good to check the mass of the FEM if that's even a thing in SOLIDWORKS. I don't know if in the FEM you can see the mass of the elements versus the CAD. Make sure your units are consistent. So that also goes back in the presentation thing. Like if you don't cross, you, you know, PSIs and megapascals and stuff like that, okay? So just pick units that you want to use in the beginning and be consistent with it. When in doubt, show both units like in a presentation, um, but be explicit with what units you're using. <clears throat> um, and, and this also goes to applying a load. It's easy to go in and type 100 and not realize the default is Newtons, okay? And, and so make sure you know what, what loads you're doing. I did find a little bit of a glitch where if you like change it, like if you write 100 um, and it's Newtons and you go, oh shoot, I want that to be pounds, and you change the units, Instead of making it 100 pounds, it converts the 100 newtons to pounds. And so, you know, you get a different, it changes the number too. So you have to then manually change the number back to 100. So just watch for that. Um, avoid putting a, a force on a single node. We talked about that. You may need to make, make a surface that you're going to apply a force to so it spreads it out over a couple elements. Um, <clears throat> And you may also need to make that stiffer. So you might be applying a load um, and you don't really care about that part, the part that uh, you, the, the little part you made to, to create the, a surface for putting a load. And I'll walk through this, I think, in the case study. You can actually ch make that two different bodies and change the stiffness of that material so that it's actually um, a lot stiffer and it's not going to like deform over the, a small area. So you, my next bullet here says you can artificially stiffen material. This is a good trick I use a lot by just changing the modulus, by making a custom material and just adding an order of magnitude to the modulus. And it's going to make it stiffer. And so sometimes when you put load somewhere, especially if you don't care about the force, the stresses right under where you're putting the load, just make a little tab and make it 100 times stiffer than the material you're analyzing. And you're not going to get a bunch of red dots in the, uh, in the area that you're putting the load. Um, also, you can use the RB, RB2s or RB3s. Um, SOLIDWORKS has an option like that. Um, sometimes it makes sense to create a separate CAD model just for FEA so you can do something quick and then transfer that, figure out your design, and then maybe you want to mo model something in CAD a little bit differently, right? So you might want to draw something with sketches and weldments, and later you're actually going to extrude something. Because uh, it makes more sense from a CAD perspective to 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 do that. Don't feel bad like you're wasting time by doing a separate FEA model that's that's drawn differently, because that might save you more time in the long run, uh, and it helps you iterate. So you can go back to that model and go, oh, what if I change this and that instead of having to change your your final design model? Um, this may I'm not sure if Lawrence lets you do this, but in, in an industry we usually use beam elements for fasteners. Um, and you can add pretension to the beam to add like compression. Um, I don't know. I, I have to figure out how solid the best way to do a fastener in SolidWorks. I think they actually have a fastener constraint, but I haven't played around with it. Um, you can so there's non-structural mass we talked about. You can add those. You can also do this by just changing the density, um, but it's a little dangerous because you might forget months later that you did that, and other people can't see that you did that. So if I open up your model. And I see a non-structural mass element, I know you have non-structural mass somewhere. Um, so if I check the mass of that FEM, it's actually going to be higher to have this non-structural mass. But if you just change the density so that you can have, you can kind of simulate a load. So you could turn gravity on instead of, if you've got a distributed load, instead of putting a force there, you could make it a denser material and turn gravity on and you're, it's just like having a distributed load over the part, right? So keep in mind, you can do tricks like that by changing material properties. Um, think about the whole design process when catting, right? You're going to do design. You're going to want to iterate. You're going to want to do analysis uh, and manufacturing from it. Um, 
I'll talk about this a little bit. Um, you know, you want to make sure your sketches are parametric so that when you when you want to change something in the analysis, it's super easy to change instead of redrawing something. Okay, and I'll kind of show that uh, in my case study. And we talked about the fill it in hole. We talked about using two elements through the thickness. Um, you can see, so when you do beam elements, it's not giving you stress through the beam, okay? It's, it's giving you the max stress on the surface of the beam. If you want to actually see the true profile of the beam that through the cross section, you need to turn on render beam profile in SolidWorks, and then you actually see it. So just keep that in mind when you do beam stresses. Um, you want to consider tolerances for key locations. Now you guys, you may not even know what a flexure is. You know, a flexure is where you purposely have thin material to like release a degree of freedom. Um, so like, you know, in your suspension where you have bushings and that can pivot, you can actually make weld a small, a really thin piece of material, you know, like super thin flexure and then like come out through a tube, right? And it's actually gonna bend about that point like, like it's a mechanism, right? Um, and that's actually what we use a lot in space structures, okay? We use flexures all the time. It creates kinematic mounts with bipods. You don't need bearings and bushings and stuff like that. But these things can be like 10 thou thick sometimes, okay? So when you do, when you're modeling something like that, uh, it could be other, other things like really thin wall tubing, like maybe your 035 tubing. Maybe the manufacturer said it's somewhere between 030 and 038. You might want to model 030 in your in your FDA to make sure you cover that, right? Your factor of safety should cover you for some of that stuff, but like in this case, we look at the drawing and we make sure the minimum uh, tolerance that makes us the minimum thickness is used in the FDA to get the stretch. And our analysts have to sign all drawings, so the analyst will look at that and they'll say, "Oh, this part could actually be a lot smaller. I modeled the nominal CAD, and I don't sign off on this. I need to rerun it at the thinner material." Okay. So um, I didn't talk about this because another advanced topic, which is symmetry. There's a, there's a symmetry uh, feature. Um, a good example is like a hub. If you have a hub or you have, you know, a five bowl hole pattern or something like that, that's, it repeats. You can just model the section and it does a symmetry constraint where it knows it's a full circle and you can apply a load and it saves, you have a fifth of the mesh, you know, that you actually need. Um, so I haven't looked, I haven't played around with it in SolidWorks, but we use, we use it a lot. Um, so um, you have to be careful with it, but just letting you know it's out there, okay? If you have something that's symmetric, you could even do it on a frame. If your frame was really symmetric, you could just slice your frame in half and put your suspension loads on, and it'll know that it's not fixed, that there's another part on the other side, okay? So um, check reaction forces and moments to make sure it matches your applied loads and moments, right? So um, this is another way to check your boundary conditions are right. You know, if you see moments somewhere you thought you had something pinned, then it's not a right boundary condition. Um, I actually don't know how the features in SolidWorks if it lets you pull for where it lets you actually look at reaction forces and stuff, but um, don't forget buckling, okay? A lot of people, especially with thin walled like frame members, you might run static structural analysis and think you're good. Buckling is an entire different analysis, okay? Static structural will not tell you if it buckles, is gonna buckle or not. And buckling analysis won't tell you if it'll if failed in yield or not. So you have to run buckling separate for anything that's a, you know, a lot, that's a subject to buckling, right? Um, so don't forget that, a lot of people forget that. <clears throat> um, document every run that you do, you should be documenting it. And I'll show you an example. In fact, I'll pull one up right now. You'll forget the next day, you'll probably forget what you did, um, let alone six months from now. You go, remember when we made that 065? Was, what was the stress we had then? You know, because you're just going to like change it because it wasn't good enough. And then later you might want to see what that was. So that might look something like uh, I, I use this at work. This, this is some. Um, I don't know why it makes this pink. Um, so, um, and we'll walk this through this in the case study, I think. So usually I start with whatever, and what you put in here is up to you, right? What do you want to track? So this, this was a modal analysis, right? I, I was checking the modes. This was for mounting a camera 
I don't know if you guys ever followed the program called LDSD, where uh, we sent up uh, a spaceship in, uh, in Hawaii. We were testing parachutes for Mars landing. And so uh, we came back into entry into the Earth's atmosphere, and we were testing a uh, inflatable, basically like an inflatable raft that slows you down. And then a parachute, a supersonic parachute, we're going like, to hop 2.3 on the aquarium set up. So I had a camera that was looking back at the inflatable structure that captured the deployment. And uh, there's actually like a picture of like, they call it like the space tech, the spaceship selfie or whatever. And it like looked, you could see that and you could see like Earth in the background. But I had to make sure that I could get the structure didn't resonate with the camera, right? The frequency of the camera, right? So I really care about the, the, the first mode is what I'm doing here. So I just run the first one. How do we know what I'm going to change later, right? And I just take notes to myself. I mean, it's not going to be the best, best example because I've had more detailed ones. And I put the file name. So when you do SolidWorks, um, when you create a study, I'll call it like static study one. I recommend you actually like call it something smart, you know, um, that you can remember what, what it's from. Um, but if not, you should just put it in your, in your little Excel spreadsheet. So put the name of the file so you could always go back and find it. Like, oh, this is this is the one I was talking about. I, I put the mass because I was worried about mass. Um, so this was, I had like a large mesh. And then these are my first three modes. And I wrote down what the mode was and I put the pictures here. Okay, so I called it like the upper, upper plate torsion was my first mode, which is this, right? It's like twisting like this, right? And then back plate, middle rib, rib bending. So this rib's bending back, right? So just writing the modes is not good enough because you'll see in a second. And then the third one I didn't put on here because I didn't care. Um, so uh, that was my baseline. And then I changed something. So I just write what I changed. This is the same as solution 1A, which is here. And now I made sure I had two elements through the thickness of the back plate because I had large elements here. And now I did two through the thickness. Okay. My modes didn't change. Okay. So right away I was like, okay, it's not worth making the mesh finer, okay? The, the two elements is not really changing anything. So I went back to large elements. And then I, I think I found out my mass. So here's another example. Here's a non-structural mass that's tied to, uh, to the plate. You know, RBE, okay? So I don't have to model the mirror that was here. I just put a mass and, put, and, and tie it to the structure. So this is, I reattached the mirror mass node because I think I, I, I found out that the mass wasn't actually attached. Okay, and my first mode dropped, like it was 66, and now there's mass attached, it dropped to 51, right? Um, it's the same modes, uh, same type of bending, but different. Um, so then I fixed the bowl holds near, like I changed the boundary condition, and I started adding results summary, that the low, lower torsion mode went away. So look, I had 51, 51, 70, you might say, yeah, 70, 72, and then you might say, oh, my 125 went to 160. No, actually, that lower torsion mode is not even on this list. It got so much stiffer. Okay. So my next mode be became the mirror mount bending mode, which is over here, right? So just putting the modes don't tell you. You need to tell you where the basically the effective mass is, right? So you just keep going through. And then I changed the file name to something else. Um, and I did something. I updated the camera mount design. So I changed the camera mount design. You can see it, it used to look like this, and now it looks like this, okay? And, and I'm checking my modes. Um, basically said, you know, this was too, too heavy. I didn't, need, I didn't need this much stiffness, right? So I went from 192 to 145, but I saved a ton of mass, right? Uh, I don't know if this is actually updated, but... Um, so yeah, and then I started changing the thickness of brackets. I go, okay, let me go to three millimeters brackets, and what happens? And you just just log it all, okay? Log it all, because I did this like eight years ago or something. I don't even know. And it's all coming back when I look at this. Otherwise, I don't even remember I did this analysis, right? It's like, um, oh, I didn't mean to close that. Okay. Um, okay. Perform sensitivity studies to find out what parameters you care about. So, for example, if you have a, a frame, and you go, okay, you know, I. Um, whether you're checking modes or whether you're checking stress, you go, okay, our stress is too high. Um, maybe I should go to, and maybe you have a one inch and a 35 thou wall. 
you might say, let me go to 1.25 and a 65 thou wall, right? You're changing a couple of things. You should just do a sensitivity study. Maybe you even do it on a beam by itself in a very simple model and say, oh, let me just change the OD um, and see how my stresses change and see how sensitive I am to the OD. And then let me change the wall thickness and see how sensitive I am to the wall thickness and then put a chart and you might see, no matter what wall thickness you choose, right, your stress isn't going down. I mean, it should, but you know what, you know what I mean? And, or it barely goes down, but if I change the OD a little bit, it like, you know, shoots down. So do some sensitivity studies before, you know, iterating a bunch on large models. Um, okay, this is where I almost didn't want to put this, but if you don't know what proper constraint to use, try them all and take the worst case scenario. Okay, I, this is just a workaround if you're like, doing something at night and like tomorrow I'll figure it out. I'll talk to someone who knows how to do this. Right. But doing this will pretty much force you to find the right constraint because you're going to find the worst one real quick and it's going to be a really high stress probably. But if you're not sure, you know, it might be where you're doing two different ones, right? That's a little bit better. Like, is this fixed or is this pinned? I don't know. Do both and take the worst case and that'll be conservative. Um, make sure you run your mesh analyzer to check for bad elements. Uh, you can open solver files in notebook and to investigate your results and stuff. So, um, you know, SolidWorks will give you these files, uh, with different extension names. Um, I'm used to FO six, but this, they use dot CWR. So like you can open, open this up in like notebook. Um, especially if you get like a failed mode, um, that's nuts. Some of these you can't actually see. I forget which one, but anyway, you can open up some of these and uh, it'll actually like give you the stiffness matrix, you know, in some cases it'll say, you know, where the, where the failure happened. It might even tell you that your uh, mesh had a, diff uh, a bad mesh or something like that. So um, when, in, when you get really stuck, look at the files that they make for you and try and open them in notebook and see if you can, you're looking behind the scenes in the FEA and see what might be a problem. Uh, we talked about scaling the forces and deflection so that we're running the models. Um, there's this thing called inertial relief, um, which can be used to troubleshoot models that don't run properly as well. Um, and it's something that can be used for like a full vehicle analysis, right? Because you have a whole Baja on the ground and you're seeing suspension loads. You, you might fix the top of the frame or something because you think that's, you know, I, if I put a load up, the car's just going to go all the way up, right? It's never going to stop. It's going to be un unconstrained, right? But what actually happens, right? The inertia of the frame and the driver is what reacts that load, right? So you actually turn on inertial relief and that will simulate, it'll use the mass, you know, of, of the uh, parts to react the, the loads, right? So that's a good way to do that. It's also a good way to troubleshoot models that don't run besides doing the modal analysis I talked about. If it says too many pivot ratios, you can also actually do inertial relief, click that on and it'll run. It'll give you a warning and then it'll run. And then you you can actually kind of see where it's unconstrained. Um, and then make sure you know you have to do nonlinear analysis if you have anything that has variable material properties. So if you're, if you're doing a brake rotor and you're using aluminum, and at certain temperatures, the properties change. You can't use linear analysis for that. Okay? You have to have nonlinear analysis. Um, if you have a part that's yielding and you want the program to actually calculate the stress after yielding, it has to be a nonlinear analysis. If you have a part that's going to be contacting, so you start with a gap and then it's going to contact and then you want the stresses to transfer between those parts, it has to be nonlinear analysis. You'll get deflections in your frame where tubes would hit each other and they're just gonna go right through each other in, in the analysis. They don't let the elements touch each other, you know, that aren't supposed to be touching each other. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and then large displacements, right? If you have any large displacements, you should get a warning that you're getting large displacements. That basically means you either didn't constrain it properly or the loads are so high that you're basically going past yielding, really. And once you have large displacements, you know, all the hand calcs assume small displacements too, right? I mean, so, um, and also your force is gonna change, the direction of your force is gonna change, you know, if, if you have large displacements. 
Okay, last slide before we get to the case study. People still have energy. Here's my disclaimer. You know, which hopefully you came to these conclusions already. Don't treat FEA like a magic black box that you're just gonna dump your CAD model in and it's gonna tell you yes or no, you have a good design, okay? You need to understand how it works. You can't blindly trust these results, okay? You have to correlate or validate each model you run. It doesn't mean every time you run it, it means at some point you have a way to validate your model. It might be after the fact through test, okay? But most of the time you're doing hand calcs, you know, sanity checks. As you get, you know, more experienced, you're going to know if the model is, is getting close or not uh, to the right answer. Um, so just know that every every amount you've ever ran is wrong, okay? Every, every amount I ever ran is actually wrong, okay? Uh, in fact, anything you model is wrong. All models are wrong, okay? This is a very useful thing. But some of them are useful, okay? And the some are the ones that are done properly, okay? So we actually say this a lot at work, right? All models are wrong, but this was a useful one because it, it gave me a general idea when it was going to fail, right? But 100% of the time, you calculate when something's going to fail, you bring it to the strength lab, you pull on it, it's not going to be the number, right? It's not going to be the number. But it's going to be, you know, close if you do it right. So that means it, it was a useful model, okay? So remember, you don't whittle something down so you have like a 1.0 factor of safety, right? I mean, because that model is definitely wrong. Um, uh, understand the limits of the software and use it responsibly, right? Use it to supplement your design and calcs and tests, okay? Don't be super dependent on it, okay? Um, don't use it for things that you can solve by hand. If you have a simple beam, first of all, there's beam formulas, right? But I mean, part of your schooling should be learning how to do this stuff by hand so you get good enough that you, you know, um, that, that you understand it enough that you can use FEA, okay? Um, it's like a calculator. Like all of us know how to do, you know, 13 times 19 if you write it out. But you understand the concept of multiplication, so it's fine to use a, a, a calculator, right? Um, make sure you understand it um, and only use it when you really need to. Um, okay, if you have, you should have less confidence than when you walk in this room on how to run FEA. Um, and if you didn't understand half of these terms, I mean, I expect that to be the case. But you also need to recognize it, it means that you're not ready to make a useful FEM yet, okay? If you don't, you know, understand, you don't have to understand this perfectly, but if you don't understand the difference between a 1D, 2D, 3D, or what a beam element does versus a bar element, I mean, it, it means you're not quite ready to get a useful FEM completed. But work up to it. That's why you're in school. You shouldn't know how to do that yet, okay? I definitely didn't know how to do that when I was in your seat. Um, and that's why I put this together, was to help, try and help you guys, okay? Um, and so work up to it, understand the basics, you should all, you know, after this, the, the next FEA you guys run, I suggest you do a model that you can validate by hand with 100% certainty, the simplest beam formula you can do. And I'm actually going to do one right now for you guys. So maybe you can replicate what I did. You can take these charts, use the geometry, and get the same results. That'll help you understand, and you'll be on your way. Um, and just know you don't need FEA to build a good design, okay? Especially computational FEA, I should say. You know, FEA, FEA software is not going to, you know, replace sound engineering and fundamentals. You know, we went to the moon without FEA, you know, uh, and so uh, at least we had, you know, women doing the FEA hand calcs for people, right? Um, and so um, just, just know um, it's not a replacement for good engineering. Okay, you guys want to see a case study or you guys burn out or what? It's like late, late, late morning for them. They just four. they just woke up a little bit. Okay. Um, take like a five minute break, like get the bathroom, get some water, maybe. Or um, good? I mean, I'm good, but if people need to. Um, so quick break or not quick? Quick break. Raise your hand. Hey, they're ready, man. How many? <laughs> I also don't get a sense for like if people are lost or like uh, interested in this topic. I mean. Um, I don't know. Are you guys uh, following along at all? I mean, is this is the case study going to be useful to you guys, or is it like a little overwhelming right now? <laughs> the case study will be super useful okay. to kind of like show show us some of these topics. Okay. So I'm gonna uh, 
myself under pressure and just do it in real time. Okay. Um, and my goal is um, to show you do a simple beam um, that's just in, you know, uh, just has a force in the middle. And we're going to solve for the stresses and the displacements using three different me methods. Okay. We're going to do the solid mesh, plates, and beams. Um, now, I don't want you guys like trying to run this on SOLIDWORKS while I'm doing it. Um, just watch and then, you, you know, I can stick around after this and help you guys if anyone wants to try to run it here. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through, I'll walk through it all and the post processing. And then at the end, when we do these three, we're, let's discuss which, which model was better with regards to the accuracy of the results, the setup time and run time, the iteration process and the post-processing info that you get from for each of these. So as I go through this, try and remember when we did a solid mesh, all the steps it took compared to a plate, compared to a beam. Okay. So here's the case study. All right. We have a, a simple, this is as simple as you can get, right? The pin, pin, beam with the load with uh, at the middle with these dimensions. Okay. Just chose uh, aluminum as the material. And this is the geometry I chose. Okay. Um, and uh, we're going to put, um, we're going to, we're going to use a spreadsheet to, which I just closed, um, to track what we did. Okay. So um, I'm looking at some, I, I should open this ahead of time. I'm going to open up. Um, so I, I did draw this, uh, this I-beam already. But I do want to show you, like, this is more of a SOLIDWORKS thing, um, how to properly like, do a nice parametric sketch so that if you were to, knowing you're going to iterate on this beam design. Um, oh, I'm going to do solid mesh first. Um, you don't want to go back and your sketch blows up when you change something, right? Let's wait for SOLIDWORKS to load. <clears throat> By the way, I'll also, if you guys want, um, show you some tricks in Excel for optimizing stuff um, based on FEA results. So um, I'll try and remember to do that. Okay, so I assume you guys, if you don't know SOLIDWORKS, that's fine. This isn't a SOLIDWORKS tutorial, but um, in fact, so I don't, use SOLIDWORKS anymore. Uh, I work use NX. Um, and I've never used simulation until a couple weeks ago. So I'm not pretending like I'm an expert in this, this software. Um, but at the same time, I basically learned it a couple weeks ago by looking up, you know, by trying it myself. And the point of my presentation, hopefully, was that you could just use it at any software, right? So in CAD, if you know the fundamentals of CAD, like how to sketch, you need a plane, you have to extrude, I can then give you NX, you know, and you'll just figure out where the sketch feature is, where this feature is, right? So that's kind of what how I focused my presentation was. You can use it on anything. Um, so you now here's my here's my sketch. Um, oh, this is yeah, we're going in the second part of the record. That's okay. We can keep recording, right? Um, unfortunately, it's blocking my. Can I move this? Okay. 